Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and well, let's talk about that picture of Sagittarius A star, the black hole in the middle of our own galaxy. The picture that was actually only revealed yesterday from when I'm making this video. And so in this video, I guess first of many videos that we'll be making about the discovery, I really wanted to talk about some of the details that were revealed uh, during the presentation if you haven't watched it, and also talk a little bit more about some of the more common questions with potential answers about what we've just observed. Essentially trying to figure out exactly what we're looking at right here, this is the image, and exactly what some of these features are, including the unusual dots, the three bright dots you see on the picture. And so let's discuss the black hole itself and of course the image of the black hole. But think of this as part one of our investigation because there are so many things to discover, which I guess is a good way for me to remind you to subscribe if you still haven't. Let's begin. So first of all, all of the info, all of the studies and everything, as always, is in the description below. So if you'd like to check this out by yourself, you can find everything there. But what I wanted to start this is with the name itself, because during my stream yesterday, one of the more common questions was, why is it called Sagittarius A star? Well, first of all, what you're looking at right here is known as Sagittarius A. It's a very unusual active radio source region in the center of our own galaxy that, as you can see from this radio image, has a lot of activity pretty much everywhere. If you look closer, there are some regions called Sagittarius C, there are certain regions called Sagittarius B, and that's because everything here is in constellation of Sagittarius. The constellation you see right there in the video from the ESO. But if you were to look around the radio region of Sagittarius A, you would actually discover an extremely bright point. A point that seems to represent a gravitational center of this particular region. This point is known as Sagittarius A asterisk or Sagittarius A star, with the star itself just being the way that we pronounce that asterisk. Although in this region you can also find some other activity in, for example, a very ancient supernova remnant in Sagittarius A East and a very unusual spiral structure in Sagittarius A West. But it's of course that unusual bright and variable spot in the middle, Sagittarius A star, that's always been of the most interest. And over several decades of observation in different frequencies, including the X-rays, the scientists were able to determine that this is most likely where our central black hole is located. With this iconic animation produced by the scientists from ESO, definitively illustrating that a lot of stars in the region definitely seem to orbit something unusual in the middle, something that possesses a mass of over 4 million masses of the Sun. With further evidence coming from many different so-called S stars, for example the most famous one being S2, we've discussed this one somewhere on the channel, should be in the description below, whose orbits even indicated that there are a lot of Einsteinian effects, including Doppler effects, happening when they approach this unusual center that seems to be some kind of a massive, supermassive object. And although there have been suggestions that maybe it's some kind of unusual dark matter chunk, maybe some sort of a exotic matter that we've never seen before, possibly even exotic matter that was predicted by various ideas and theories, some of the recent papers definitively establish that whatever it is, it seems to be in an extremely small region of space. And so by definition, this could only be a black hole, because nothing else can be so dense. And one with a mass of approximately 4.2 to maybe 4.3 million masses of the Sun. All of this was established by observing those S stars and a lot of other objects orbiting in this region for many, many years, actually over two decades now. But then a decade ago, back in 2009, several scientists kind of decided to create something unusual. They proposed an Earth-sized telescope in order to possibly observe some of these black holes or maybe even create an image of one. The idea sounds a little bit preposterous at first, but as more and more radio telescopes became operational around the planet, it actually sort of became a reality. This idea became known as the Event Horizon Telescope because their main purpose became taking a picture of a black hole. And so since roughly around 2017, by using eight different observatories on the planet, they started to essentially collect a lot of radio data from several regions in the universe, specifically focusing on two black holes, M87 and Sagittarius A star. Here's by the way what the size of the aperture of this telescope in theory looks like. So it's an Earth-sized telescope. But there is a small side note I'd like to make that I also mentioned on the stream. Since there were only eight observatories involved here, it's as if you had only 8 pixels in your camera. So imagine having a smartphone camera where only 8 of your pixels work. Now in order to take a picture of that camera, you're going to have to take a look at something for an extremely long time and very likely come up with some kind of an algorithm in order to work out 
what each of those pixels saw and how all of this connects into a bigger picture. That's literally what they had to do for many years. Since 2017, all these observations then had to be combined using a very, very complex algorithm and also using thousands of terabytes of data collected from several observatories on the planet, with the most difficult location to reach and also get data from being the one in Antarctica. You're about to see the observatory right there. And so creating this image literally involved a bunch of different points from different telescopes trying to sort of create a full picture at the end. And in this case, the picture would actually look entirely different if certain telescopes were absent. So the more telescopes, the higher resolution we get. And also, in order to create an algorithm that would work with all these observations, the scientists had to run computer simulations using supercomputers in order to determine what they're most likely to see in this region. So essentially, this was a combination of computer simulations with physical observations from these eight radio telescopes. And there's obviously a reason why they chose these two black holes and nothing else. Not Andromeda Galaxy, for example, which has been mentioned on my stream. Both of these black holes, if you were to look at them in the night skies, would represent the largest possible objects. Although largest here is a bit of a misnomer. Here they actually compare the size of this to essentially seeing a donut on the surface of the moon. That's how tiny these black holes are in our night skies. But still, these are the largest black holes we see in the night skies, so these would be the easiest to potentially image. At the moment, we don't actually have technology for anything else. And here's the donut. But there's a reason why Sagittarius A star was not shown to us back in 2019, but instead they chose to present us with M87. Even though M87 looks slightly smaller in the night skies, as you're about to see here, it's actually significantly bigger. If you were to basically place it much closer to us, it would be a gigantic object. Here's uh, what it's going to look like very, very close to um, Sagittarius A star. So here's another way of visualizing this. If you were to look at the M87 picture, you'd notice that you can fit the orbit of Pluto into the black hole's shadow, with the Voyager 1 probe being at the edge of the shadow. But inside of this, a tiny pixel would literally represent the size of our black hole and even the size of its accretion disk, with Mercury's orbit representing the approximate size of the entire image we saw. And so the difference here is actually quite dramatic. The black hole inside M87 is approximately 1500 times more massive than the one in the Milky Way, but it also happens to be approximately 2000 times as far away from us. So because of this, their size in the night skies is relatively similar. But the advantage of taking a picture of M87 is really in regards to how fast things move here if you were to look at them from a distance. So first of all, M87's black hole, or M87 star, or Poehi as it's also known, happens to be an active black hole. So there's a lot of activity here, there's also a lot of sort of churning and turning, but the material here, because of the size of the accretion disk, moves much, much, much slower. As a matter of fact, you can actually look at the same spot for a pretty long time and collect a lot of data from that spot. Specifically, gas can actually take anywhere from days to even weeks to orbit around this black hole. But around our own black hole, because Sagittarius A star is not an active black hole and also because the accretion disk here is much, much smaller, things here move very, very fast. It could actually take anywhere from a few minutes to possibly a few hours for some of the particles to move around. And that means that collecting data here is way more challenging. You basically are looking at something that's moving so fast that any kind of an exposure photography is going to be practically impossible. One of the best images I found recently to illustrate this is actually this. If you haven't seen this before, take a guess at what you're actually looking at. Well, you might be able to guess simply based on the observations of the environment near these unusual lights. This is a train. It's a fast moving train the picture of which was taken during nighttime using long exposure. And in essence, this is kind of similar to what you're seeing here, except that these images were produced slightly differently. In this case, the pictures of these two black holes were produced using two techniques, clustering and averaging. This video right here kind of explains how this works. So first of all, you take a bunch of creations and you try to cluster them into different, most common images. Cluster 1, cluster 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Then, by taking each individual most common cluster, we try to average everything out, creating the most likely representation of what this black hole might look like. So in essence, this kind of explains some of the features we're seeing here. These three unusually bright dots, for example, 
were simply created because these were the most common elements appearing in most of the pictures. If you look closer here, you can actually see that, for example, in the first cluster, there were only two of these bright dots. In the second cluster, there was this very bright dot right here, which obviously appeared in at least a dozen of different images. And then we had these other spots in the other locations as well. And so by averaging all of these images, they've created this. European Southern Observatory also created a kind of a more easier to understand simulation to help us understand how this works. In this case, using this mountainous formation to show us how they did this. So here we're taking a bunch of images of the mountains and we're taking them during different times of the day and during different types of weather. Then by taking all of these images and clustering them together, we're going to find most common elements. Then by averaging these clusters, we're going to be creating something that looks like this, like the image on the right. And so this image shows us what the average representation of this structure is. With the skies behind it sort of representing a blur of different weather effects, even though individual frames might actually look entirely different depending on the time of the day. And so we're not seeing the exact image of the black hole, but we are seeing a kind of a averaged out version of everything that happened here during the period of the observation which lasted for a few months. And also a super important addition here is that this is not an optical image. The orange and yellow here represents radio light. So in essence, we're not actually seeing this. What we are seeing are various radio emissions coming from various parts of the accretion disk due to the interaction of matter, plasma, and most likely magnetic field that create this super, super hectic environment with a lot of radio waves coming our way. So in that sense, this is more of a scientific slash symbolic representation of the black hole as opposed to an actual image. In reality, if we were to potentially be there and look at this with our own eyes and possibly some other sensors using, for example, X-rays and gamma ray detectors, we would probably see an extremely powerful, fast-spinning torus of dust and a lot of material, where things move very fast, things flicker a lot, there are a lot of explosions, a lot of different emissions, or maybe even something resembling what you see in this video, with a large dark object in the middle producing certain dilation effects and also certain Doppler shifts and other effects predicted by Einstein. And since all of this stuff is essentially plasma, it would to some extent resemble our sun. And also one of the more common questions during the stream was in regards to maybe using other telescopes like the iconic James Webb telescope to maybe take a better picture of this so we can actually see what it looks like in, for example, infrared and optical light. Well, once again, that would probably not be possible because this right here is already a much bigger telescope. The size of the mirror on James Webb is very, very tiny in comparison. But even if we were to capture an image from here, we would most likely see almost nothing, for one simple reason. The galactic center is very, very thick, and most of the dust here pretty much makes the observations in optical light, or even in infrared light, quite impossible. But even if we could see the black hole in optical or infrared light, because of the distances involved, nearly 26,000 light years away from us, we would still not really be seeing much. And here we would still be dealing with the same problem of things moving way, way too fast around the black hole because of the dramatic changes in brightness and a lot of other changes, including the changes in the shape of the accretion disk. Even without dust covering everything, James Webb would still not be able to produce a very good picture. As a matter of fact, the only way for us to take a better picture of all of this, specifically using radio light, is to add more observatories around the planet or potentially launch observatories into space, which can create an even bigger aperture for this particular telescope. And this is something that has been planned by the EHT team, but at the moment there's no future plans for any of this. And also, generally this would be pretty expensive. Any kind of a space telescope usually requires huge amounts of funds. And so that averaging and clustering technique is really, at the moment, the only way to make these images and to make any observations possible. But this is just obviously the first such step. As a matter of fact, now that we know that the region around our own black hole doesn't seem to be as active as some of the other black holes, it might actually be possible to take even better images in the future, or even help the scientists see the event horizon and the shadow of the black hole, studying it in a lot more detail. And one of the more surprising discoveries coming out of this image is really in regards to how all of this seems to fit well with Einstein's theory of general relativity. Specifically, the size of the ring and even the size of the shadow fits almost perfectly into every prediction scientists have been making for many years. And this applies to both M87 and Sagittarius A star. 
which of course confirms that many theories in regards to black holes for the most part seem to be correct, which also means we can start making other predictions. But just the fact that despite size differences, these two black holes seem to appear quite similar to one another already means that by observing one black hole, we can start making a lot of assumptions and inferences about other black holes as well, including some that are really, really small. And so even though these two black holes are located in two completely different galaxies and seem to be generally quite different from one another, they seem to be still very, very similar, especially at their edge with most likely any differences that we see just being because of certain types of material that's present on the outskirts. For example, maybe more dust, more different types of stars, or some kind of a supernova remnant, which could have added material that would not be there otherwise. But these differences can actually help us figure out how these black holes interact or even shape the environment around themselves. In other words, by looking at these minute differences between different black holes, we might be able to finally start figuring out how a typical black hole might actually affect the rest of the galaxy. Although for our own black hole, Sagittarius A star, it's still a bit of a challenge to see things and to actually analyze things. Mostly because the orbital period extremely close to the black hole is only approximately half an hour. But to get really accurate data from planet Earth, we want to observe something for at least 12 hours. So unfortunately, there's just no way to try to resolve this just yet. With a lot of this very turbulent and extremely powerful plasma, basically blocking a lot of the other observations in other types of wavelengths. But despite all of these successes from the Event Horizon Telescope, and despite the fact that there are now two images of black holes, there are still so many unanswered questions. Even simple questions, such as, for example, how far away is this? Like, for example, during the stream, the distance was mentioned as 27,000 light years away from us. But the most accurate observations from Japan, from only a couple of years ago, suggested that the black hole is approximately 25,700 light years away from us. So even the distance to the black hole is still currently unknown. Then we have more questions in regards to astrophysical jets. How exactly are these formed? Today it's believed that a lot of magnetic interaction happens around the black hole that causes this to happen, but it's still a bit unclear. Also in this image, what exactly happened around the spot here? How is it that so many different images from the black hole seem to have a much brighter spot on the far side of the black hole? One explanation could be because of the flares in the far side of the accretion disk, which could then be seen because of the bending of light from the far side, but at the moment it's not really clear. But I guess the biggest question out of all of this is, what exactly is the orientation of the black hole toward us? During the ESO stream, some of the scientists suggested that it could be actually sort of almost facing us. As in, instead of being sideways with the accretion disk possibly showing us the edge, we could be looking at this from maybe this angle. Now that currently does not make sense, and as I mentioned in the stream, the reason it would make sense is because of the discoveries from just under a year ago, where the scientists identified actual remnants of ancient astrophysical jets that might have been created only a few thousand years ago, and they were pointed more or less perpendicularly from us. So something here doesn't add up, or maybe the black hole has some kind of a precession slash some kind of a wobble where it does sort of move around this way. Now that's of course a huge assumption, and right now there's really no proof of any of this, but this is sort of where I reached the level of my ignorance in regards to this image right here, and I'm definitely going to have to follow up on this, because I would love to find out what exactly the scientists discovered in regards to the orientation of the black hole. At the moment it's super unclear, and seems to be the biggest mystery. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing this relatively recent discovery about this somewhat exciting region that we're sort of in the middle of, known as the local bubble. The region that you kind of see simulated right here, and something really exciting has been recently discovered about this region, helping the scientists understand and to some extent map a lot of the nearby star formation regions, and also helping us understand how most galaxies, including of course the Milky Way, most likely evolve and create new stars. But I guess more importantly, really helping us understand a little bit more about our own neighborhood and our place in it. But first of all, let's start with this beautiful map created a few months ago, the map I showcased in one of the older videos, that basically shows us what the local neighborhood sort of looks like with all of the nearby stars, with the sun right here in the middle, but also sort of demonstrating a lot of different cloud formations around the sun itself. 
with this distance right here being approximately 65 light years across. And if you look at this map, you'll see that our sun seems to be sort of in the middle of two different clouds, the local interstellar cloud and the so-called G cloud. And a lot of modern studies are actually trying to understand what effects the clouds that we're sort of passing through has on, for example, planet Earth, on a lot of different types of radiation reaching the solar system, and more importantly, if it actually has any effect on the climate, of course. Mostly because some previous studies have even suggested that by passing through these clouds, it sort of increases the amount of interplanetary dust, which can then maybe block the sunlight. Now, none of this has been definitively proven, and most of this is still kind of just assumptions and ideas that are kind of difficult to prove, but it still would be interesting to find out if passing through these clouds has really any effect on anything in the solar system. The more important point here is that, well, there are quite a lot of these clouds, and most of them were most likely created by ancient supernova. But if we were to zoom out of here quite dramatically, we would also find ourselves in the so-called local bubble, sometimes also referred to as the local cavity. And this unusual cavity or this local bubble, in essence, is a kind of a void that's approximately 1000 light years across, with quite an unusual shape, not really spherical, where the actual density of hydrogen, and specifically neutral hydrogen, is approximately 10 times lower than it is everywhere else in the galaxy. Or in other words, it's basically a low density area. In other words, it's a kind of a structure that seems to be extremely low in density and has way, way less hydrogen than a lot of other areas in the Milky Way. And to be more exact or to be more mathematical, in the local interstellar cloud, the density of hydrogen is approximately 0.3 atoms per centimeter cube. Or to give you a more visual analogy, a single volume equivalent to a typical sugar cube would contain 0.3 hydrogen atoms. But if you were to leave the cloud, and if you were to then reach the so-called local bubble, the density drops by about 10 times. It becomes about 0.05 atoms per a single sugar cube. And so the question here was, well, first of all, what exactly created this local bubble or this low density cavity? And more importantly, does it have any effect on the nearby space? And for the longest time, one of the main culprits for the creation of the local bubble was the very, very famous pulsar that exploded as a supernova, the pulsar known as Jiminga, one of the brightest pulsars in the night skies. But this was an assumption from years ago, and since then the scientists realized that the local bubble is just way too big to be produced by a single supernova. And this is one of the first things that this recent study was able to kind of clarify. The study here explained that at least several different supernova over a period of about 14 million years had to occur in order to create the local bubble that we have today. So it wasn't just one single pulsar, it actually probably created several pulsars and possibly even several black holes. Interestingly, the study also clarified that the Sun and planet Earth were not around back then, and it just so happens that we entered this region completely by accident now. In other words, the fact that we are right at the center of this local bubble is sort of a complete accident. The solar system is flying through this region and is going to leave this region in the next few millions of years. But because there were 15 different supernova happening here, at least one of them might have affected planet Earth to some extent as well. Although that's not really the main point here. The main point is that, well, this bubble is still quite dynamic and it's still growing, with the material moving away from the center at approximately 6 kilometers per second. But what's even more exciting about the discovery from this paper is the fact that the scientists identified several star-forming regions, and so here we're talking about regions where usually you have very active star formation, all of which seem to be right at the edge of the bubble, all of which is slightly easier to see in the map that you can find in the description below. In other words, what this study suggests is that this bubble and the creation of this bubble might be directly responsible for pretty much most of the star formation in all of the nearby young star forming regions. And that of course includes pretty much most of the molecular clouds that scientists usually use to study these star formations. As a matter of fact, this study even goes as far as implying that within about 500 light years away from planet Earth and the sun that you see right there, all of these star forming regions and all of the young planets and young stars literally sit on the surface of this giant bubble with the bubble itself most likely being directly responsible for initiating their formation. 
possibly by forming some kind of a pressure wave as all of the cavity expands and creates the actual conditions needed to start star forming regions with all of this driven by the pressure creating from a lot of these supernova in the past. And specifically these seven star forming regions that have been studied in the past by many different studies all seem to be right at the surface of the bubble. And that's actually a pretty big discovery. This implication suggests to us that maybe this is actually how all of the star formation starts in various galaxies out there as well. Basically by having these really large cavities that are created by various supernova, the surface of these cavities, the surface of these bubbles, might create all of the necessary conditions for new stars to start forming and thus create new generation and new population of stars that will then lead to new supernova that will then produce even more stars. Furthermore, just the fact that we seem to be right in the center of such a super bubble is basically a statistical anomaly. It just means that there is a really, really high chance these super bubbles are extremely common, mostly because we found ourselves right in the middle of one. It's very unlikely that there's just one such bubble in the entire galaxy, well, because statistically we would not be right in the center of one if these structures were not common. And that of course implies that the Milky Way galaxy is probably made up of all of these super bubbles all over the place, with many of them doing exactly the same thing, creating these cavities and creating the surface of cavities where new stars form. To some extent the scientists in this paper even compare this to Swiss cheese, with every hole in the galaxy, or every hole in a cheese, created by these really large supernova that happen over time, with each individual surface of each individual bubble serving as the new formation region for new stars and new planets. Furthermore, because all of these star forming regions seem to be moving away from the center of the bubble, with the actual velocity vectors pointing away from the center, all of these discoveries from this paper further suggest that this seems to be indeed the process that leads to the formation of a vast majority of stars in the galaxy possibly not all stars, but many stars. With this 3D map right here being the most accurate representation of the nearby space. But naturally, there are still quite a lot of questions. For example, we obviously don't know how many of these bubbles or super bubbles we would find in a galaxy like the Milky Way. Because technically these are voids and they contain less material on the inside, they would be very very difficult to detect since it's a lot easier to find something rather than find nothing. The scientists also don't really know if these bubbles end up touching at some point and what happens if they do touch. Do they actually interact with one another in some way and if they do interact, what exactly happens when they do end up colliding? But I guess the bigger question here is, well, how exactly do these super bubbles and their expansion drive the formation of new stars? What processes play a role here in order to begin the star forming regions that we've observed so many times in different studies? They obviously produce some kind of a pressure wave because of these ancient supernova, but what's the actual process by which the pressure wave then forces the material to start coalescing into stars? So definitely a lot of questions to answer, even though this is a pretty exciting discovery helping us understand a little bit more about our own galaxy. And today we're going to be discussing yet another mystery slash observation coming from the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way. And this time it's a mystery that's been sort of, I guess, mysterious for quite a long time now, for actually close to about four decades. The mystery of these unusual filamental structures found pretty much all across the galaxy that we live in, but also in other galaxies as well. With the new updates in regards to this, creating this absolutely mind-blowing image that you see right here, that essentially demonstrates how many of these filaments are in our galaxy, with a new study and some of the new images revealing nearly 1000 of these unusual strands, with some of them as long as 100 to 150 light years in length, stretching pretty much all over the galaxy, but mostly in the center. With many of them also possessing some really unusual features, many of them being multi-layered or positioned in an extremely orderly manner, with some of them also being part of some other unusual structures, and other ones potentially connected to some other unusual phenomena, such as these unusual radio bubbles that you see right here. 
And even though the original filaments were discovered back in the early 80s, even today, after four decades, the actual explanation and the actual origin of these filaments is still not particularly well understood. Nevertheless, the scientists still have learned some things about them, with a lot of new studies, both describing some of the features observed from these filaments, and also sort of speculating on the potential origins. With I guess the first natural question being, what's inside of these filaments? What are they actually made out of? And the answer here is somewhat surprising. These filaments are most likely made out of extremely fast-moving cosmic rays, and specifically very fast-moving electrons that seem to be moving near the speed of light. With something extremely powerful accelerating these particles to very, very high velocities, and then as a result producing these very long stretch structures. Like I said, some of them are 150 light years in length, and some of them are also relatively thick. Some of these filaments are at least half a light year in thickness. And so whatever is accelerating these electrons to these velocities has to be super powerful. Potentially being some of the most powerful astrophysical events, very likely involving really, really massive black holes or some really, really powerful explosions. But because of the way that some of these filaments are structured and the way that they are stacked on top of each other, or because of the way some of them are basically side by side with each other, it's still very difficult to answer if all of these filaments are caused by the same type of an event, or if they're all produced by something slightly different or possibly entirely different. In other words, the mystery is still a mystery. But some of these new studies, especially the ones you can find in the description below, decided to create some of the most detailed observations of these filaments, while also analyzing some of the individual ones, but also studying them as a whole as well creating the very detailed and somewhat beautiful map you can find in the study in the description below. In the process discovering approximately 10 times more filaments than we originally saw in some of the previous studies. With this very beautiful but somewhat eerie image that was produced using the data from the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory, taking nearly three years to produce. And in this case, this is a radio image, or basically image produced in radio frequencies, with the overall frequency being 1.28 GHz, which essentially helped the scientists uncover quite a lot of different phenomena, including some still unexplained phenomena, which seem to represent either outbursts from different stars, possible supernova remnants, or some other unusual phenomena such as radio nebula that you see right here. And so by combining the data from some of the most powerful radio telescopes, with the ability to finally remove some of the background that was essentially blocking some of these filaments, the scientists were able to discover some really incredible sites we've never seen before. With some of the initial investigations, trying to figure out how the magnetic fields inside these filaments connect to the potential cosmic rays that could be coming from some really powerful sources in order to create these very long, very beautiful features. In other words, the scientists are trying to figure out the exact mechanism responsible for creating these very long filaments. And they are slowly getting to that final answer. For example, some of the initial propositions from many years ago suggested that maybe these filaments are created because of some unusual supernova that create very powerful emissions which then create these particular filaments as a result of some sort of magnetic interaction. But having investigated these filaments and compared them to the supernova observations that do have visible radio emissions as well, the scientists learned that the radio emissions coming from the filaments are actually very different from the ones coming from the supernova, suggesting that their origin is probably not the same. Basically, the supernova are very likely not responsible for this. But approximately two years ago, another proposition decided to focus on a slightly different idea. The idea of supermassive black holes that generally are also responsible for producing a lot of cosmic radiation, a lot of cosmic rays around the universe. And this actually kind of connects to the other observation from a very different type of a telescope, from the X-ray telescopes. The Chandra X-ray telescope in the last few years has also been discovering these very similar filaments, but obviously in the X-ray frequencies. Here's actually one of many images produced by the scientists a few years ago, we've discussed this on the channel in one of the previous videos. And right there, the red box is sort of pointing at one of these mini filaments, which also seem to possess somewhat similar morphological features. In other words, they also look the same. And so, is it possible that their origin is kind of connected? Well, the proposal from a couple of years ago sort of explains how this could form in theory. And in order for this to work, it would just need two things. 
a relatively powerful black hole emitting very powerful astrophysical jets, creating the so-called cosmic rays, and some sort of a nebula with a lot of gas in it. And so essentially, as all of these cosmic rays from the astrophysical jets start to spread away from the black hole, some of them could end up crossing some sort of a molecular cloud, so basically a nebula. And according to the scientists, with more explanation that you can read about in the description below, the interaction between these very powerful cosmic rays and some sort of a molecular cloud is actually going to produce several different types of very, very light, but also very fast moving electrons, with the ones that have higher energy producing X-ray filaments, yet the ones that don't have as much energy producing radio filaments. In essence, explaining that all of these filaments could have been actually the signs of ancient activity of our own supermassive black hole, with some of these jets essentially hitting some of the clouds in the vicinity and producing these effects. And to some extent, this sort of makes sense. Mostly because very similar filaments have already been detected in other galaxies that have been previously active. And some of these galaxies, especially more active ones, seem to have a lot more of these filaments. But at the moment, this is just a preliminary explanation, mostly because even though the scientists have a lot of radio data, with nearly a thousand of these filaments already detected and explored, at the moment, unfortunately, the X-ray data is really missing. There are just not a lot of X-ray observations, or more specifically, there are not a lot of accurate X-ray observations, because unfortunately, there are just not enough X-ray telescopes out there doing all the work. And so until the scientists can start collecting more X-ray observations, and find more of these X-ray filaments, and then possibly find a connection between these filaments and the radio filaments, this particular idea is still going to be just a hypothesis, and would be somewhat difficult to prove. But nevertheless, it's still the only reasonable explanation we currently have. Okay, I guess it could also be aliens, but it's never aliens, so the only reasonable explanation we currently have. Although it's also possible that at least some of these filaments are maybe connected to some of the other unusual events, such as various radio bubbles discovered in the past. Although, even if we can explain their origin, it's still difficult to explain how some of these filaments form in the way they form. For example, some of them seem to have extremely ordered separation between the microfilaments on the inside. In some of these clusters, they seem to be perfectly separated by a distance of about one astronomical unit away from one another which actually sort of resembles what we usually find around the Sun, the so-called solar loops. They also tend to be extremely orderly separated, and all of this is formed by the magnetic lines. And so if these are the magnetic lines of the galaxy, this obviously needs a completely different explanation, and would probably require a lot more thinking, and a lot more observations and analysis. At the same time, it's not even clear if these filaments change dramatically over time, or even if they move around, mostly because these observations are relatively recent and we haven't really observed any changes yet. And so if there is any motion detected or any additional changes, it might actually be more reasonable to assume that these have a very similar origin story to what we actually detect around the solar surface, magnetic lines. So definitely still a lot of unanswered questions, but I guess still the biggest question is, what created these? How were these made? And along with the other radio mysteries we've discovered in the last few years, such as various radio bubbles, it once again confirms that it's a pretty exciting time for radio astronomy. A lot of new mysteries, a lot of unanswered questions, and a lot of future exciting answers and exciting studies. Which means that we'll definitely come back to this and talk about it in some of the future videos. And today we're going to be discussing some of the new discoveries and some of the more unusual discoveries in regards to the actual shape of the Milky Way galaxy, and more importantly, what created these unusual features that we're going to be discussing. Because unlike the typical representation of the Milky Way, which basically makes it look like a disc-shaped galaxy with a relatively flat plane, all of the modern discoveries suggest otherwise. In the last few years, the discoveries suggest that not only is our galaxy warped and seems to have an unusual shape for one reason or another, it also seems to contain several major ripples across it, formed in a very similar way to how ripples form on a typical liquid. In this case, because of some kind of a massive interaction with something else that used to exist here billions of years ago. But, as you're about to discover from the recent study, we've learned that it seems to still exist here, and the scientists finally know exactly what caused it and how all of this works. But I guess first, a little bit of history. Some of the initial discoveries from back in 2002 
From an extremely long-running survey known as SDSS, Sloan Digital Sky Survey, started to uncover a lot of interesting features not just about the entire universe, but also about the Milky Way galaxy as well. And specifically about certain regions in the galaxy that seem to possess way more density than other regions, representing what the scientists refer to as overdensities. Back then, the scientists discovered several different clumps with different density of stars at some of the outermost edges of the galaxy itself. And the first such structure discovered back in 2002 today is referred to as the Monoceros Ring, something that seems to contain approximately 100 million solar masses in total and something that seems to be about 200,000 light years long. It's essentially a kind of a clumpy structure or some kind of an overdensity that forms a ring on the outskirts of the galaxy. But this was just the beginning. In 2015, in this study, the scientists identified several other structures, eventually discovering at least four of these ripples at different distances away from the center of the galaxy. For example, there's the Tri-Andromeda ring, the south-middle structure, and the north-near structure as well. And although this was only seen in one part of the galaxy, today it's assumed that this is essentially a ring that seems to go around the galaxy itself. But because these are ripples, they also seem to have very similar features with some parts going up and some parts going down. And because of this, it's actually relatively difficult to see the rest of the galaxy, or to be more exact, to assess the exact size of the galaxy because of the unusual overdensities present in certain regions. And so back then, the assumption was that maybe our galaxy is much larger than we initially thought. Instead of being slightly smaller than the Andromeda, it was now assumed to be anywhere between 150 to 180,000 light years across, or very similar in size to the Andromeda galaxy. Which also implied that maybe the solar system is actually a lot closer to the center than we initially thought, approximately a halfway away from the center, as opposed to lying at two-thirds of the galaxy's radius. But despite the discovery, it was still not clear exactly what these clumps are, and more importantly, how exactly they were formed. Some scientists speculated that maybe these are remnants known as the stellar streams, so these are usually streams left by various orbiting galaxies that used to exist here, and have now been tidally disrupted by the Milky Way. Other scientists suggested that maybe these are just anomalies and don't exist throughout the entire galaxy, yet some other scientists suggested that maybe this is due to gravitational effects from something around the Milky Way, with more observations revealing even more hints, and specifically establishing that many of these formations were not really aligned with the disk of the Milky Way. Even four of these separate structures, with the closest one being about 6,000 light years away from us, were positioned either above or below the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. But intriguingly enough, the distance between them was more or less the same, approximately 6,000 light years in between major structures, as if, once again, these were ripple-like structures produced by some kind of a massive interaction, and once again implying that these were ring structures, with some other studies even potentially discovering what seems to be a vertical ripple, or I guess a ripple that's only visible in this particular perspective, not really a ripple that's visible from the top. And a lot of these earlier studies started to imply that a lot of this seems to be kind of correlated with an orbit of another galaxy known to us discovered not so long ago. And that actually includes that vertical ripple as well. I mean, this study right here kind of spoils it. Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. A galaxy whose initial influence was completely unknown to us, but in the last few years, the scientists discovered some really intriguing things about it, and it's by the way barely visible somewhere right there, including the fact that it seems to have initiated major star formation in our galaxy, maybe even creating the solar system, and by the way, thanks Sagittarius Dwarf, also more recently discovering that it seems to contain huge amounts of gamma ray emissions, possibly because of pulsars, or maybe because of mysterious dark matter, something that was initially a mysterious phenomenon inside the so-called Fermi bubbles. But as we discussed in the recent video you can find in the description, turned out to be the result of Sagittarius Dwarf as well. But more importantly, the most recent study almost definitively shows that the interaction of Sagittarius Dwarf galaxy with the Milky Way almost definitively caused the ripples of the Milky Way at those specific times when the Sagittarius Dwarf passed through the disk of our galaxy, implying that at least twice, as the Sagittarius Dwarf passed through the Milky Way, it caused all of the stars around it to mysteriously dislocate and oscillate at different speeds. Something that the scientists were able to confirm by observing the extremely accurate measurements of the motion of various stars, 
with the values for these stars measured by the iconic Gaia telescope. And so by using the data from Gaia, and also employing the technique the scientists refer to as galactic seismology, the scientists were able to compare the estimates for the interaction of Sagittarius Dwarf with the current motion and the current location of various stars. Here is a brief summary of what we currently believe might have happened 5.7 billion years ago, and once again 1.9 billion years ago as well, with the third passage and the final passage possibly occurring about a billion years ago. And here is maybe another way of visualizing this, by trying to compare the formation history of most stars with the known parameters for the stellar stream created by the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, so we know that it seems to have crossed the Milky Way at least three times. And this, as a result, created quite a lot of disturbances in the Milky Way, producing the ripples that seem to have appeared around the same time as well. Although according to the scientists in this paper, most of these ripples appeared during the last passage approximately a billion years ago, implying that maybe originally there were more ripples, but with time most of them seem to have dissipated and disappeared, and only some remained up until now. And the most recent ripples are probably actually much smaller than they used to be back in the days. And that's because we know that with every passage, Sagittarius Dwarf lost more and more mass, with the last passage very likely involving the galaxy that already lost most of its mass. But even a billion years ago, it was at least 20 times more massive than it currently is. Today it's believed to be at least a thousand times less massive than our own galaxy, meaning that most of the mass was stolen from it and deposited into the Milky Way, or at least left in the stellar streams that you see right here. But I guess more importantly, highlighting how extremely influential this galaxy was on the evolution of morphology, or essentially the shape, of the Milky Way itself. It seems to have affected the star formation, it might have even created our own sun, it definitely affected the formation of stars in the last billion years, and it formed these unusual ripples, which though for us are kind of invisible, are very likely visible from outside of the Milky Way. Not to mention that it also obviously contributed quite a lot of mass to the total mass of the Milky Way afterwards. But we obviously have other dwarf galaxies orbiting around the Milky Way as well. As a matter of fact, the large and the small Magellanic clouds that you see right there at some point might actually have something similar going on as well. They might start falling into the Milky Way, produce their own stellar streams, force their own star formation as well, and disrupt the galaxy even more, producing even more ripples or potentially even other unusual features, thus allowing our galaxy to evolve even more. And then one day we're going to have one of the major collisions in the history of the Milky Way, the collision with the Andromeda and the Triangulum Galaxies. But by then, planet Earth will have transformed dramatically, and life will probably no longer exist here. There is something really exciting about the idea of being the first explorer, and the idea of exploration in general. Becoming the first person ever to explore something no one has ever seen before. And we can only imagine today what early explorers and early cartographers of the 15th century must have felt when they were essentially discovering all of these new lands, all of these new continents, and were essentially trying to map the entire planet, exploring places no one has ever been to. Something that generally today can only be captured by things like movies, books, or possibly video games. And although there are still some places on the planet, for example places in the deep ocean, that we haven't really explored yet very well, and the places where the scientists even today are trying to create various maps, for the most part the idea of cartography and the idea of exploring the world is something that's basically in the past. Or is it? And that's kind of where I wanted to start this video, because it looks like we now have, or will have, a completely new way of mapping things and a completely new area of modern cartography. Something that's no longer constrained to planet Earth, and something that is actually still in its infancy and is going to be exploring some of the nearby regions very close to the solar system. Something that we're actually only now trying to figure out by using a lot of modern telescopes and a lot of modern technologies. Now this particular video that you can find in the description is one of the most recent studies that tries to create a three-dimensional image of a well-known structure known as the Barnard's Loop, in the process of discovering that it was very likely created by some kind of a supernova. You can learn more about this in some of the links in the description, but that's not what we're talking about. Because we're going to be talking about something even more grandiose, something that several scientists have been now exploring and working on for I guess over a year, and something that in my opinion kind of resurrects the idea of early cartography, the idea of creating maps and exploring completely new areas that nobody has ever seen and nobody has ever visited 
but also probably never will, mostly because a lot of these areas are really far away. And we actually talked about the first version of this, I guess just over a year ago, where I showed you the map itself and some of the discoveries from this map that essentially shows us the Sun and the Solar System right here, and all of the nearby stars, as well as all of the nearby important objects, such as various clouds, various formations that potentially were supernova remnants, and the entire neighborhood around the solar system within the vicinity of approximately 32 light years. And there were some really interesting discoveries coming from this, including the discoveries about the so-called local cloud, and also showing us how the solar system that's right here is actually in between two different interstellar clouds, and it's probably going to be entering another one. But if you'd like to learn the details, check out the video somewhere in the description or somewhere right there. But now, a year later, one of the scientists behind this paper reached out and actually mentioned that, well, he's been working pretty hard on the next version. The version that's even more grandiose in scale, and with all of this becoming possible because of the ESA's Gaia telescope. The incredibly powerful telescope that for the past few years has been very actively mapping the night skies, and specifically producing the motion of various objects in the night skies, orbiting in the same region where we currently have the James Webb telescope, Lagrange 2 point. And very recently Gaia has released its third major release of data, representing the most accurate and the most complete multidimensional map of the Milky Way galaxy and some of the other objects outside of the galaxy. In this case also mapping various types of dust, showing the galactic disk with stellar clusters, mapping the radial velocity and the proper motion of nearly 30 million objects in the Milky Way galaxy, creating maps of interstellar dust, and now also including what's known as the chemical map, which allows the scientists to measure the stellar metallicity and the chemical composition of various stars, which by itself is called astrometry, a way for us to measure the precise uh, position and precise motion of different objects in the solar system, in the galaxy, and even outside of the galaxy. With the telescope being so extremely precise that it even allows the scientists to measure what's known as star quakes, actual quakes on the surface of various stars. And in this case, this video is absolutely brilliant. It actually allows us to even hear the stars if you were to convert their pulsation into the actual sounds. Here's roughly what all of this sounds like. And so here the dark patches that you're looking at are slightly colder compared to the bright patches, with all of this creating periodic changes in the brightness of the star. And so all of this is going to become super useful for studying various stars around the solar system. But because of this incredible precision in the measurements of these different objects, it also allowed some of the other scientists to start mapping the nearby vicinity of the solar system and to essentially start focusing on trying to become the modern age cartographers. They are now able to create a kind of a visual representation of a lot of different objects and a lot of different systems and a lot of unusual and somewhat difficult to explain uh, phenomena that seem to be happening around the solar system and even farther away, all the way to the distance of several thousand light years away from us. So let's take a look at what they've discovered so far. So I've already showed you this map, this is approximately 10 parsec across or about 33 light years, but imagine now that you were to zoom out. Well, all of this, the local cloud right here, is now going to be just this tiny blotch in the middle. And so now we can see what's going on even farther away. First of all, as you can see, we're basically in the local bubble. But as you zoom out enough, you'll start noticing that there are quite a lot of different bubbles and a lot of different clouds all over the place. And a lot of these are completely unexplored even today. So all of this essentially represents Terra Incognita the completely unexplored parts of the galaxy that we're still trying to learn about and still trying to understand. And honestly, I'm barely familiar with most of these. Now, some of them are more iconic, like for example, this right here is the Orion molecular clouds, with the famous Orion nebula that sort of looks like this from planet Earth. But many objects around it, or even the objects inside of it, would be for the most part unfamiliar to most of us. But then by looking at this as a whole, you also start obviously seeing that there does seem to be a slightly higher concentration of activity in certain regions. For example, there's a lot of dust in this region, there's not so much in the local bubble, and also not so much in this region either. And you also realize that a lot of these dust clouds are usually associated with a lot of activity inside of them. And so basically the clouds themselves here represent the signs of past activity with the map legend in this case also telling us the approximate age of some of these objects. Some of them are really young, only approximately 100 million years old, whereas other ones would be billions of years old. 
And so this bubble right here represents approximately 2600 light years away from the solar system, which also represents this part of the galaxy. So a relatively small part of the Milky Way galaxy. And it also comes in two versions, with the second version even showing us all of the stars located here as well, just in case you wanted to find out what stars are present in certain regions. But that's not it. There's another version that zooms out even more, with this version now taking us even farther away. So the local bubble once again is here. Now if we were to zoom out even more, we'll start discovering the areas that are even barely visible to the Gaia telescope. And here's what all of this looks like if you were to zoom out completely. So essentially, that's the entire map we have right now. And all of this is based on the data from the Gaia telescope. Although you have to remember here that this is still a very early version, and it's still in its infancy and there could be some mistakes as well. But overall, this looks absolutely mind-blowing. So basically, we are somewhere right there. With the map I showed you previously only reaching to this point, which is once again approximately 2600 light years. And from the center to the edge, this is about 20,000 light years. Roughly representing the area you're about to see in this video. So, quite impressive, quite a huge volume of space, but as you can see from the detail, which is sort of lacking in this case, all of this is still in its infancy. We barely know what's out there, and we're really only scratching the surface when it comes to understanding what's happening in our own galaxy and what sort of features and various structures exist in the vicinity of the solar system. Like for example, you can see right here, there are thousands and thousands of light years of various types of dust. So much dust, as a matter of fact, that it seems to block the region behind it, with only very few features located behind it that are still visible. For example, there's one right here, there's another one right here, and there are some other ones, but the majority of them are completely hidden. And so the outline of the feature that you can see right here, that represents this very thick cloud, basically hides the rest of the galaxy from us. But some parts, as you can see, are much lower in density. In this case, the scientists behind this study started to assign different names to them. So we have this Bay of Capricornus, we have a relatively long strait of Circinus, and some other interesting regions here and there. But overall though, all of this really reminds me of those super early maps of planet Earth from the 14th and 15th century. The maps that would show the world in a completely different way from how we imagine it today. And the maps that, although correct to some extent, would eventually change dramatically as we learn more about the world around us. So for example, this right here is the Mediterranean, and this is Italy. And so just like these maps changed over time, I'm pretty certain all of this would change as well. But this is still a really really interesting first start, and actually a super exciting attempt in trying to create something visual that we can kind of relate to, and something that our brains can sort of understand. It's a two-dimensional map of a three-dimensional environment around us, with the numbers in brackets around different objects kind of showing us how far away the object is below or above the galactic plane. And since our galaxy is believed to be relatively flat, the two-dimensional map here kind of makes sense as well. In other words, at least in theory, we should be able to create a functioning two-dimensional map and should be able to read it and understand it, even though the actual galaxy is obviously three-dimensional. And since all of this is freely available, you can go and explore this using some of the links in the description below, and by using one of these interactive maps yourselves. But as you can obviously tell, this is still very very early, and this is still just the beginning. We've only gotten this far. And so our knowledge of the Milky Way is still quite limited. But we're getting there, and we seem to be improving every single year. Hello Info person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about yet another unusual discovery coming from the center of our own galaxy. But it's not a black hole, or any other exotic object. It's actually something that is quite common and something that seems to exist everywhere in the universe because of the phenomenon of the accretion disks. Because as you might already know, a lot of things in the universe seem to possess accretion disks that then seem to create the object itself. This obviously applies to black holes and neutron stars, but it also applies to different stars and it might even apply to newly born planets. And based on various observations from various telescopes, such as the ALMA telescope, today it's generally believed that the accretion disks are responsible for the formation of pretty much every single low or medium mass stars and various planetary systems, including of course our own sun, and pretty much most of the nearby stars as well. But there's one question that a lot of scientists currently cannot answer. Does this also apply to some of the larger and more massive stars? So here we're talking about stars that are at least 30 or maybe 50 masses of the sun, or possibly even in the hundreds. 
For example, this iconic star known as R136A1, the most massive star ever discovered, is potentially over 300 masses of the Sun in mass. So was this star also created in a similar way? Was there also an accretion disk here as well? Or did this star form by maybe collapsing into this mass directly? Or maybe in some other way? And so that's essentially the question that the scientists have been trying to answer for a pretty long time by looking at various examples out there. And so very recently, a team of scientists whose paper you can find in the description below was essentially exploring the center of our own galaxy and specifically looking at the region known as the Sagittarius region. The region where we have the supermassive black hole known as Sagittarius A star, with the black hole itself being visible somewhere right there. But the Sagittarius region doesn't just contain Sagittarius A in it, it has other letters as well. Actually, overall, all of this kind of looks like this. So there's a lot of activity here, there are quite a lot of different emissions in various frequencies, but Sagittarius A star seems to be the most active of them all. And this is where we know there is a black hole. But as you can see, there is also Sagittarius C region, generally located a little bit to the right if you were to follow the galactic plane. Now naturally this is also an extremely active region with a lot of different activity, a lot of different stars, huge amounts of gas, with the overall density of space being approximately a million times higher than the space very close to the solar system. Or in other words, there's about a million times more gas and a lot of other stuff compared to what we would find in the vicinity of our own sun. And when looking in this region, the scientists have completely by accident identified something that looks like, well basically, a kind of a miniature galaxy which made it look like a very strange object to be located in such an unusual place. It's as if there was some kind of a smaller galaxy present inside the larger galaxy, the Milky Way, with the total size of this object being approximately 4,000 astronomical units across, so not actually that big at all, which is about 6% of one single light year, making this a relatively small object, but obviously much, much bigger than the solar system. But what exactly was this object? Well, in theory, I guess it could be some kind of a galactic remnant, or possibly some kind of a galactic object being swallowed by the Milky Way, which we know happened quite a lot in the past. But in this case, it was just way, way too small compared to anything else we know exists out there. Most galaxies are at least a few hundred light years across. This one was like a million times smaller. And the main reason the scientists in this case got confused by this object is of course because of these unusual arms that it seems to possess it kind of made it resemble a typical spiral galaxy. As a matter of fact, we kind of think that maybe this is what the Milky Way galaxy looks like if you were to look at it from the top. But when measuring this disk further and then trying to determine its mass, they discovered it possesses approximately 32 masses of the Sun in total, which suggested that this was basically some kind of a proto-star, a baby star. And it was also gravitationally stable, but seemed to possess these unusual arms. But it didn't take them long to figure out what most likely happened here. They now are pretty certain that this used to be a much larger disk and definitely resembled something we see in other star systems. But something must have passed very close to this disk, which makes sense because, as I mentioned before, this is a very dense area with a lot of different stars in the vicinity. And when passing close to the disk, this object disturbed the formation of the protoplanetary disk and ended up forming these unusual spiral arms, with the scientists in this case even identifying the secondary object. Or, in other words, none of this was strange, unusual, or mysterious in any way. This was basically a result of a near passage between two stars, or possibly a star and a baby star, which as a matter of fact we believe could have happened to the solar system as well. There's at least one video that should be somewhere right there or in the description that explores this concept in more detail because of the analysis of various ancient meteorites discovered across the solar system. And so, by disturbing the accretion disk, it formed the unusual spiral arms, but also captured some of its mass, which could, in theory, result in the formation of more baby planets around this probably older star. Or it could result in something entirely different, which means that the scientists should be probably looking at this as well. But I guess more importantly, what's coming out of the study is the fact that it definitively proves that larger, more massive stars seem to be also formed in the same way. In other words, they also seem to form using the accretion disk model. Mostly because the total mass here is over 32 masses of the Sun. And so by the time the star has formed, it will most likely form something really giant and something really bright. But also something that's most likely going to go supernova pretty quick, within just a few million years. But the other impressive thing here is the fact that all of this is located about 26,000 light years away from us, 
And also in the region that's generally really difficult to see. There's just so much dust here that generally hides a huge proportion of the galaxy from our view. But in this case they were able to see, identify and even measure the mass and the size of both of these objects, with the smaller star being approximately three masses of the Sun in mass. Although all of this was discovered not by looking at these objects, but by running simulations and trying to recreate the scenario where the scientists could also create these unusual arms in the model version of their protoplanetary disk. And it seems to have worked and they seem to have determined that this is pretty much the only way where you can produce these unusual arms without breaking any major laws of physics. With all this very likely happening approximately 12,000 years ago. With the other important discovery in this case being the fact that this is the first protoplanetary disk discovered in the center of our own galaxy, which of course means that this region definitely possesses new stars, and the stars that are created and destroyed in a very similar way to stars we find in other parts of the galaxy and we find everywhere around us. Despite the fact that this is such a dense region with so much activity and so much potential for a destruction of any new object. But because of this first discovery, it also might suggest that there could be more similar objects discovered in some of the future studies, with many of them very likely still being hidden by all of this dust. And so it's only a matter of time before the scientists discover something else really exciting and really unusual. Today, when we generally think of a galaxy, we kind of imagine something that looks like this. A structure that's mostly composed of stars that are visible to us and that generally produce quite a lot of light that's then visible from very far away distances. With a classical image of the Milky Way being something like this as well. And then from the side, it would maybe resemble something like this. Although today we know that it's generally also kind of warped and has quite a lot of ripples all over the place. But what about the things that we don't see? What about things like, for example, black holes, neutron stars, various types of gas, various types of relatively hard to detect particles, and everything else that makes a typical galaxy? Well, that is of course not as easily visible. As a matter of fact, none of this is simulated here or in any other media that we generally use to explain science or to explain the universe. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing one of the first maps, or I guess one of the first 3D images of essentially what the galaxy most likely looks like if we were to look at it imagining things that we don't see, or at least imagining things that we know exist but are just not visible. The remnants such as black holes or various types of neutron stars. That at least theoretically we believe should be all over the place, but we only have found a handful in the last few decades. And mostly because they are just impossible to see. We can only see them if they are absorbing a lot of mass from the partner and are then re-emitting this mass in for example X-rays or if they're producing very unusual observational effects such as gravitational lighting effects, which are also extremely rare and relatively difficult to see. But theoretically the scientists believe that there are millions if not billions of these objects out there and they should also be considered to be part of the galaxy. And so to try to figure out what all of this looks like, the scientists ran a few models, a few simulations, made a few assumptions in regards to what happens to these objects once they're created from, for example, a typical supernova, and then mapped this overlaying the typical picture of the Milky Way galaxy, producing the map of what the scientists referred to in their paper as a galactic underworld. The view of the galaxy where we sort of only see the objects that are unseen to us, neutron stars and black holes. The remnants of various supernova that happened over the past 13 billion years. And though in the past the scientists have discovered several neutron stars and black holes around the recent sites of various supernova, this represents only a tiny tiny number compared to the total that exists out there, with pretty much the vast majority of them now being almost completely invisible. And today we know that all of the stars out there at some point are going to transform into some kind of a remnant. The majority of them are just going to become some sort of a white dwarf, basically exactly what happens to our sun as well. And eventually these will turn into a black dwarf as they cool down over time, although in this case trillions of years. But stars that are at least 10 solar masses are going to explode, producing something else as a result. The ones that are less than 25 solar masses are going to end up as neutron stars. With vast majority being completely invisible to us, but some becoming pulsars or potentially some other unusual stars such as magnetars. The stars that are more than 25 solar masses are going to produce black holes and some of the most massive stars might actually leave nothing behind. They might go through something known as parent stability supernova, basically destroying themselves entirely. But things like white dwarf we can generally see 
and can also detect them from relatively far away distances. And also because white dwarfs don't experience supernova, they generally also stay in the same area of space. And if you were to remove every other star and just leave white dwarfs behind, it would produce a relatively similar shape, but obviously much, much dimmer overall. But because neutron stars and black holes are formed from supernova, this also adds a bit of a kick to them, having them actually get displaced across the galaxy and thus creating a map that's very different from what we have in terms of regular stars. And so the scientists that produced this new model took all of this into consideration. So for example, they looked at the distribution of various stars in our galaxy right now, and also looked at some of the more massive stars in our galaxy, simulating where we can find most of them, and how most of them will end up changing their orbit over time. But they also took into consideration the fact that a typical supernova will give them a bit of a kick into a random direction, with some of these stars potentially reaching very high velocities. And because many of them might even be older than the majority of the stars in the galaxy, they might have actually traveled across the Milky Way for nearly 13 billion years. And so even though typical stars might resemble something like this, with each of the points representing some kind of a star-like object, the so-called galactic underworld would look entirely different. The distribution of these stars across the galactic plane creates something that's at least three times thicker than what's produced by the visible stars. If we were to colorize this, it would look something like this. Here's what we think Milky Way might look like, although in this case it's kind of simplified, but here's what the galactic underworld looks like if you were to remove all of the stars, leaving only neutron stars and black holes behind. And more intriguingly, they discovered that at least a third of these stars possess velocities high enough to actually escape the galaxy, implying that a large proportion of all of these neutron stars and black holes is actually escaping the galaxy, and at some point are going to end up completely by themselves traveling in the intergalactic space, which also means that many of them already are there and potentially create quite a lot of invisible mass between various galactic objects, for example between the Andromeda and the Milky Way. And this also implies that over time the Milky Way seems to be actually decreasing in mass, I guess in some sense you could call it evaporating. And though that's kind of expected of other objects, such as typical globular clusters or a lot of other star clusters that can over time lose their mass and a lot of the stars present here, mostly because of the gravitational interactions, nobody ever thought that it would be possible for the Milky Way itself to actually lose its mass in a similar way. And in this case, it does seem to be pretty significant. I mean, we're talking about a third of all of these massive objects. Which of course, if confirmed by other studies, would actually present an interesting opportunity to study how galaxies lose mass over time and potentially explain some of the mysteries in regards to some observations that suggest that there is definitely some mass missing in various galaxies. So there's definitely a few mysteries to be solved here, assuming of course the simulations are correct. And another intriguing discovery in this case was the fact that many of these remnants seem to be distributed relatively equally across the galaxy suggesting that pretty much most of the stars in the galaxy should actually have at least one of these remnants within at least a hundred light years away from the star. And that suggests that for our sun, the remnant should be within about 65 light years at the most, which means that it might actually even be closer. But because it would not be emitting any light or produce any energy whatsoever, it would be practically impossible to detect it at the moment. And so some of the upcoming observations from the Vera Rubin Observatory might actually help us find some of these objects and thus resolve some of these mysteries as well. This observatory is going to be the most powerful we have right now in being able to track various objects using gravitational lensing effects, something that we usually use to detect various planets, but something that can also be used to obviously detect black holes as well. But I guess the biggest surprise here is just how different the shape is from what the galaxy looks like by looking at regular stars. This actually kind of reminds me of a typical elliptical galaxy, compared to this galaxy like what we think Milky Way most likely is. With the overall increase in density as you move away from the disk, mostly being created by the interaction with various objects, but also because of these kicking effects from various supernova. And so that final moment before the object becomes a black hole or a neutron star definitively determines where it's going to spend the rest of its time as it travels the galaxy. As a matter of fact, in the past, at least 20 different hypervelocity stars have been discovered across the Milky Way, and most of them are believed to have acquired their velocity because of various supernova. But the majority of the objects being kicked out are very likely neutron stars and not so much black holes. That's once again because of the total mass. A black hole is more likely to be a lot more massive and thus influenced a lot less by these supernova. 
which of course suggests that after billions of years, the objects that are going to be mostly left in the galaxy are going to be black holes and of course various white dwarfs. But nearly 40% of neutron stars, because of that supernova kick, end up escaping the galaxy. Which of course suggests that the intergalactic space could actually be filled with various neutron stars flying all over the place. But because these supernovae are so unpredictable and create what's known as asymmetric explosions or asymmetric kicks, could be in any direction, if you compare these pictures once again, you'll notice that even the galactic arms seem to disappear from this image. And so this right here could be what the future of the Milky Way will be like in the next 10 to 20 billion years. Assuming of course the universe survives that long. And that also of course means that when we look at various elliptical galaxies, such as for example the largest one known to us, the galaxy known as IC1101, what you're looking at here are mostly red dwarfs, a lot of white dwarfs, but also quite a lot of invisible black holes and very likely lots and lots of neutron stars escaping this galaxy. Once again, assuming that the study in this case is correct in the assumptions that were made to simulate this. But of course, what all of this means for the future of the universe and the future of the Milky Way is not really known to us. I'm sure a lot of studies will try to investigate this in more detail and possibly even find some of these neutron stars as they escape the galaxy. But at least for now, we know that if we one day discover some unusual emissions somewhere out there, somewhere where they shouldn't be happening, and if we actually find the effects coming from a distant pulsar, it might actually finally make sense if the study in this case is correct. In 1968, one of the US satellites, completely by accident, discovered that there was an unusual gamma ray glow coming from the center of our own galaxy, specifically from the constellation of Sagittarius with more and more of this excess gamma ray glow discovered over the last few decades. And even today, this is actually still one of the bigger mysteries of our own galaxy. There seems to be a tremendous amount of gamma ray glow coming from certain regions of the galaxy, and specifically from the central regions you're about to see in this video. And unfortunately, even today, nobody actually understands what exactly is causing all of this and how exactly any of this works. But there are at least two major theories and both of them have been discussed on this channel before. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing one of the main theories and one of the recent studies that seems to want to confirm this once and for all, explaining what's most likely causing this and how we can potentially explain all of this using standard physics without breaking any laws and also without proposing any unusual phenomena that we cannot prove. And by the way, that original detection of gamma ray glow from 1968, the article for which you can find in the description below, was discovered using some of the first ever scientific satellites, in this case one known as OSO3, Orbiting Solar Observatory, the third such satellite. And it actually possessed a very interesting experiment from the MIT University, whose main purpose was to look for unusual gamma ray radiation somewhere out there. But over the years, more and more unusual radiation was detected from certain regions, and eventually the scientists were able to produce the gamma ray map we have today with one of the most iconic maps being created with the participation from the Fermi telescope. This is the map you see right here. But back in 2009, there was this paper based on some of the observations from the Fermi telescope that clearly identified that there was unusual excess of gamma rays in certain regions of the galaxy, where in theory we do expect to have very high concentrations of dark matter, the mysterious stuff that we believe exists all over the universe. And today the scientists refer to this as the Galactic Center GV access. GV stands for Giga Electron Volts, or the energy of a typical gamma ray. And so back in the days, specifically a decade ago, this was one of the bigger proofs for the potential existence of dark matter extremely close to the center of the galaxy. And this idea relied on dark matter being some kind of a particle, specifically the particle known as WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particle. And so in this case, by having a WIMP particle and a WIMP antiparticle annihilate, they might end up producing a lot of radiation, including gamma rays. And so even though not a lot of WIMPs would be doing this on the outskirts in the so-called dark matter halo, due to the much higher concentration near the center of the galaxy, we would expect quite a lot of them doing so right here. And so that was one of the potential explanations. But because this area is also extremely crowded with a lot of different stuff, a lot of different stars, a lot of different types of gas, a lot of activity and interaction, and generally represents a very hectic and very energetic region, there could also be other explanations as well. 
these gamma rays could technically be produced by pretty much anything. And so in the last few years, or in the last decade or so, the scientists were desperately trying to answer, so exactly what could it be that produces these gamma rays? As a matter of fact, further discoveries determined that this um, unusual detection here wasn't actually very smooth. And if it were dark matter, you would expect it to be sort of spread out relatively equally. But in this case, GCE, or galactic center axis, was kind of clumpy, it was basically chunky. Almost as if there were chunks of matter that seemed to represent much higher density of gamma rays compared to everything else. And some studies even suggested that it was sort of representative of some sort of a point source. But generally there is a limit to what can produce gamma rays. So in some sense it could be a lot of very active black holes. But that was way too many to be explained by simple theories or simple observations. However, this new paper that was released not so long ago presents this other explanation that has been going around for a pretty long time as well. It provides a lot of evidence that it's most likely huge amounts of different pulsars. And we're talking about like at least a hundred thousand or probably even more. And each one of them possesses quite a lot of energy and is able to produce very powerful gamma rays through the interaction with nearby matter. But pulsars were some of the primary culprits for this a few years ago, and one of the papers in 2017 actually found a reason to reject this as a potential explanation. With the main reason for the rejection being the fact that nobody expected there to be so many pulsars in this region. And although we know that certain pulsars are definitely able to produce gamma rays, the vast majority of pulsars detected not so far from planet Earth are only able to mostly emit X-rays. So gamma ray emitting pulsars are actually kind of rare, at least in our vicinity. But the famous pulsars, like the Vela pulsar you see right here, do emit gamma rays quite frequently and quite periodically. But the question is, can there actually be so many of them in a relatively small volume of space? Can there be 100,000 of these in the central region? Well, one way for these pulsars to generate gamma rays is by having extremely powerful magnetic fields or by having a slightly different formation story compared to some of the pulsars near us. For example, one way to generate certain really powerful pulsars is actually by having a white dwarf system first, and specifically a binary system with two relatively common stars, where both turn into white dwarfs, and then one of these white dwarfs keeps stealing some of the mass from its partner and eventually becomes a neutron star or a pulsar. And so by having a pulsar slash white dwarf system, and by having roughly around 100,000 of these objects in a relatively small volume of space, in theory this could explain the observations we're seeing. And more specifically, it could also explain another mystery from some other studies, studies like this one that you can also find in the description below, that detected some of the more unusual microwave haze visible with some other telescopes and also located in a relatively similar region. With this haze also possibly being created by these particular objects, once again, because of the interaction between a white dwarf and an extremely powerful pulsar and all of the magnetic fields that are present here. And so at least in theory, by having approximately 100,000 of these binary systems with pulsar and a white dwarf in there, the galactic center excess could be explained and also could explain some other observations. With only one unanswered question here, how could 100,000 such systems be created in this particular region? And is this just an extremely common way for different star systems to sort of end their existence, turning into white dwarf binaries where occasionally one of the white dwarfs becomes a neutron star because of the absorption of mass. Now we know that pretty much the majority of stars in the Milky Way are binary, and many of them are of the mass where they will turn into white dwarfs. So having so many white dwarfs in that region is not really surprising. But it would be a little bit surprising that so many of these binary white dwarfs do end up as a neutron star and a white dwarf system that end up having these really extreme interactions with extremely powerful energy being produced in the process. It's obviously not impossible, but it is nevertheless kind of unusual. And also unlike the explanation involving dark matter particles that have still not been discovered, it doesn't really require any new physics or any unusual explanations. And although originally the dark matter scientists used this gamma ray axis as a very definitive proof of the existence of dark matter, if this paper is correct, dark matter explanation could actually not be very good anymore, especially because WIMPs have not been discovered even in 2022. Pulsars, however, could be a really good explanation. 
especially because of the clumpiness of this unusual region, and because this also explains some of the other observations as well. Or well, the chances are, even for the next few years, we might not actually have a real answer. This is still a big mystery, and it's a mystery that we're not going to be able to answer until further investigations using other frequencies or even better gamma ray telescopes, which are not really happening anytime soon. And because pretty much all of the dark matter experiments on planet Earth so far have not really found any WIMPs, that other explanation using 100,000 pulsars right now is really our best bet. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing some new discoveries in regards to our own galaxy, the Milky Way, and more specifically, the morphology or the shape of the Milky Way. Because once again, something was discovered about the Milky Way, suggesting that our original perception of what Milky Way might look like might have been a little bit incorrect. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, if you were to Google Milky Way, you'll see something that looks like this. This is what our stereotype of the Milky Way is right now. But because we're basically looking at the galaxy from the inside, it's practically impossible for us to visualize this, because all we're seeing is this. And so identifying the actual shape of our galaxy has been actually a priority for many decades now. But it's still very, very difficult. But thanks to some of the new advances in telescope technology, and more specifically, a really one single mission, the ESAS, or European Space Agency's Gaia Telescope, has been accurately mapping the distance to various stars for a few years now. More and more studies started to come out, allowing us to calculate distances to various objects extremely precisely, and thus start to create various three-dimensional maps, working out certain structures in the galaxy itself. And because of these advances coming from the Gaia Telescope, that's why essentially we were able to discover so many new features of the Milky Way galaxy in the last few years. And this year alone, there have been a lot of different videos, or a lot of different topics that I've covered, essentially helping us realize that the Milky Way is a little bit different from what we imagined. A lot of these videos are going to be popping up somewhere right there at some point. And so anyway, so now we have some more discoveries, and a few more discoveries suggesting something else that we didn't really realize about the Milky Way. And this first discovery comes from the region away from the center of the galaxy. The region that's usually referred to as the galactic anti-center. So basically, if we are here and this is the center, now we're talking about what's on the other side in the dimmer regions on the outskirts of the galaxy itself. The edge of the galaxy, if you want to refer to it that way. And here's sort of what this region looks like. But it's always been somewhat difficult to study this region because, well, we're basically inside the disk of the galaxy and there's a lot of dust here. This entire region of the so-called galactic midplane, where we're also located right now as well, generally has a tremendous amount of dust all over the place that also interferes with a lot of different observations, especially away from the center of the galaxy. But it's not because it's like fog hiding stars, for example. It's actually because the dust in front of the stars ends up interfering with the emissions from the stars and makes it extremely difficult to calculate the exact parameters of those stars. For example, if we want to discover the certain distance to a star, we really have to get the direct light from it. But if there's dust in between us, the calculations in this case become a lot less accurate. And because of this, it's always been difficult to study this region. But a lot of theoretical studies predicted the existence of various types of small filamental structures, to some extent maybe somewhat similar to the ones you see right here, although these are produced by magnetic fields, that could potentially exist in the outer disk of the Milky Way and formed through the interaction with various satellite galaxies that would either collide or possibly even get absorbed by the Milky Way through billions of years of interaction with some of the more extreme versions of this, usually referred to as the stellar streams. A lot of these have been discovered in the past, and a lot of them seem to be connected with ancient dwarf galaxies that either got absorbed or somehow interacted with the Milky Way. But the theoretical calculations also suggest that smaller such structures on the outskirts at the edges of the Milky Way from the interactions with various small galaxies. Yet interestingly, this new analysis revealed something that scientists did not expect. It revealed a tremendous number of these structures, way, way more than they expected, with just some of them visible right here as these lines you see on the screen. And the existence of these very, very large filamentary disk structures that seem to be present all over the midplane of our galaxy, at least in these numbers, is currently very difficult to explain. 
For example, here there seem to be seven of them, with this, by the way, being the Large Magellanic Cloud and the Small Magellanic Cloud. This right here is the bridge connecting them. And this large formation represents Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy that we've discussed in some of the previous videos that's currently being broken apart by our own galaxy. Either way though, just a number of these formations is kind of difficult to explain, but it probably does have something to do with some of the other galaxies being broken apart by the Milky Way as well. With one explanation suggesting that maybe these are just tidal arms from various interaction between the Milky Way's disk and various satellite galaxies that somehow disturbed it one way or another. Since there are so many different satellite galaxies the Milky Way has, close to about 50, it's sort of expected that a lot of them will create some kind of a deformation in the disk. But as we've discussed in one of the previous videos, a lot of these galaxies have never actually been in this vicinity, so many of them have never interacted with the Milky Way. Which means that maybe this was created by some of the other galaxies that used to exist and were eventually absorbed by the Milky Way itself. And some of the previous investigations of similar streams that were detected a few years ago suggested that many of these stars are extremely old. They're basically over 8 billion years old. This means, of course, that a lot of this interaction probably happened a long, long time ago. Or maybe all of this is somehow related to the discovery from a few years ago that suggested that our galaxy somewhat warped and has these unusual formations at the outskirts, which could then create these very large distortions at the edge of the galaxy, which we're now observing as these unusual formations or these unusual filaments. In other words, it's currently anyone's guess. What is clear, however, at least from these studies, is that the edge of our galaxy is far from being quiet. It seems to indicate a lot of exciting activity, a lot of different types of impacts, a lot of different kicking around, and a lot of different types of mixing of materials, which potentially created all sorts of different filaments. And so if I were to use my very poor Photoshop skills to try to illustrate this using this Milky Way image, instead of being very orderly and very even as you see it here, it's probably full of different disturbances, all sorts of unusual filaments, all sorts of unusual spiky formations. With all of this being a sign of billions of years of interaction between various satellite galaxies and the Milky Way. Okay, that's probably not what it looks like, but I tried my best. But that's just one of these discoveries about the edge of the galaxy. There was another discovery also around the same time, and also from the same data, but this time about one of the galactic arms of the Milky Way that's actually one of the most well-studied arms to begin with. The Perseus arm you see right here, with the Sun itself being located in this region. And once again, if we actually look at our current understanding of the Milky Way galaxy, the way we think it looks, it might possess these very orderly, very nicely shaped arms, with basically this being the stereotypical image from a typical textbook. But because we didn't really have Gaia telescope data up until recently, nobody really knew how well structured and how orderly all of this appeared from a distance or basically if you were to look at our galaxy, from the top. And interestingly, for this study, the scientists decided to rely on a combination of Gaia telescope data and all of that dust that I previously mentioned. The observations from the dust actually helped the scientists discover what all of this looks like. And in this case, by creating a 3D map of dust located in a certain part of the galaxy, we can generally use this to examine large collection of stars and where these stars are located. And so by using three-dimensional gas maps created by another team and combining this with new observations of various molecular clouds that are usually connected to these dust clouds, the scientists were able to work out the actual shape of Perseus galactic arm, which then allowed them to create a three-dimensional reconstruction of what the entire arm might sort of look like. And although all of the previous work suggested the arm was very well defined and had a very specific structure, this study presented a completely different image. All of the gas that was previously believed to be located in the same region was actually much, much farther away from one another, suggesting, of course, that the arm might actually be just an illusion, or it at least does not have a very distinct and very narrow shape. The authors refer to this as a clumpy, chaotic formation. And in this case, a lot of this material seems to stretch at a distance of about 10,000 light years even though it was believed to be in a relatively similar region of space. Which the scientists behind this paper suggest that, well, maybe at least this region of the galaxy, although possibly even other regions, seem to resemble another galaxy we're very familiar with. 
the galaxy known as M83 or Massey 83 that possesses arms that do have a lot of breaks, a lot of irregular shapes in them, and overall seems to be extremely mysterious as well, because a lot of these formations also present a lot of different types of activity. A big number of supernova, a big number of different star formation regions, but it also seems to contain a double nucleus in the center, which to some extent might explain why these arms are not as defined. Although at the moment, because this is just a completely brand new discovery, nobody really has any idea what's going on, and why Perseus arm seems to be so disorganized and so chaotic. And so for all we know, maybe some of the arms are disorganized, but other ones might be more structured. And so if I get back to my Photoshop skills here, we now also have to sort of destroy or disassemble the Perseus arm with my new Milky Way version resembling something like this. Definitely more of a Picasso here than um, Rembrandt. Anyway, I'm just bad at art. So what all of these studies suggest to us is that, well, we still are basically learning about the morphology of the Milky Way, and the last five years, and a lot of different studies using Gaia Telescope, have been absolutely instrumental in discovering the true image of our galaxy. It does not seem to be this simple shape. It doesn't seem to be so organized and so well defined. It clearly contains a lot of filaments and a lot of disorganization on the inside, and also some of its arms might not be well defined. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing some of the new discoveries in regards to the unusual shape of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. Because even though most of the simulations and most of the simple images make it look maybe something like this, in reality it seems to be very different from this. Very, very different. With the new discovery from the study you can find in the description below, focusing on the shape of what's known as the stellar halo, and also discovering that it seems to be quite tilted, quite stretched, and sort of resembles an egg. Potentially broken in at least two different places, and also tilted to the rest of the galaxy. But why exactly does it look like this, and what exactly are we looking at here? Well, that's what I'm going to be explaining now. So first of all, when it comes to observing the shape of our galaxy, it is obviously really challenging. We're looking at everything from within the galaxy, and we're trying to understand what the shape of the entire galaxy is, by observing individual stars, and by then trying to combine all of this into a three-dimensional map. Now, thanks to the incredible Gaia telescope, the scientists have been slowly getting better and better at this, and were actually able to map quite a lot of stars already, finding the exact distances to a lot of different objects in the Milky Way. But this is a pretty slow process, and it's also not a process that can be applied to all of the stars, especially at far away distances. And so in this case, the scientists behind the study had to combine some of these observations with a separate survey known as H3, Hector shell in a halo at high resolution. A survey that's also been collecting data on a lot of distant stars, including their chemical composition. And so over time, a lot of these surveys helped us understand that even though we think the galaxy might look something like this, or basically something like this, like a typical this galaxy we observe from a distance, the reality is a little bit more complicated. First of all, as we've discussed before, the galaxy seems to be warped quite dramatically, with the warp itself very likely being caused by a dramatic collision with another galaxy billions of years ago. The results of this collision are also visible in various streams that have already been discovered by various surveys. We refer to these as stellar streams, and they essentially represent ancient galaxies that basically fell apart as they slowly got absorbed by the Milky Way, leaving behind just a few stars and potentially some kind of a core. Here are some of the most recent ones discovered not so long ago, with a lot of these globular clusters that you see very likely representing some of these ancient cores, or leftovers from other galaxies that used to orbit and eventually got absorbed. But on top of this, as you can see, there's also a kind of a halo. There's an inner halo and an outer halo. And when it comes to galactic halos, generally there are three different concepts here. There is the mysterious dark matter halo that all of the galaxies seem to possess, and what the scientists use to explain the rotation of various galaxies. But that's of course the concept that's a little bit more controversial with some of the other scientists. Then we have the huge amounts of gas, or the gas halo, that's essentially mostly hydrogen, but also a lot of other gases, released from various supernova or a lot of other events, that essentially distributed the gas across the galaxy and even threw it outside of the galaxy. But then finally, we also get the stellar halo, or essentially a lot of ancient stars that for one reason or another got basically ejected from the galaxy and are now orbiting in very peculiar ways. So three separate concepts, all three called halo. 
but generally all three studied in very different ways. But when it comes to visual observations of galaxies, it's really only the stellar halo that we usually see. I think the iconic image from the Sombrero galaxy kind of helps you visualize this a little bit better. So this whole glowing halo around the galaxy, all of this is formed by individual stars. We don't really get to see the gas, it's only visible in other frequencies, and we obviously don't really know much about dark matter or how to observe it either. And so when we do mention a shape of a galaxy, we usually just talk about the stellar halo. In this case, in the Sombrero galaxy, it does appear to be more or less symmetrical and distributed in a relatively equal way, with the galaxy itself also being relatively flat. But it seems to be that the Milky Way is not, and looks very different from this. With the very detailed observations from the study, using roughly around 5500 halo stars, at distances going all the way to about 200,000 light years away from the center, revealing that the shape here is very unusual. First of all, it seems to be tilted, but it also seems to resemble a kind of an egg. And even here, the egg itself seems to be somewhat weirdly shaped and has several breaks inside of it. And that's very different from what we always believed or from what the scientists even expected. It essentially means that even this picture now has to be changed. Not only is the disk warped, but also Halo itself seems to be shifted and potentially has a lot more layers and a lot more parts inside of it, with the egg shape itself tilted by approximately 25 degrees. But interestingly, this is not the first time this was implied. Even five years ago, this particular study right here suggested that the Halo was probably some kind of an ellipsoid. But I guess the question is, why? Well, the answer to this maybe comes from some of the previous observations of that tilt and a lot of these streams we've discussed previously. So unlike the sombrero right here, the reason we have the tilt and the warp and the reason there are so many streams is of course because of really massive collisions in the past. And the one that was probably most influential in the past, that happened a few billion years ago, is the collision that left the marks that you see right here. These are all individual stars from the galaxy we sometimes refer to as the Gaia Sausage. Or the most scientists refer to it as just the Sausage Galaxy. Also referred to as the Enceladus Galaxy or Gaia Enceladus. And this galaxy collided with the Milky Way a few billion years ago, with potentially this being its core that's still around and is still orbiting around the Milky Way. This is a cluster known as NGC 2808. With this simulation right here kind of showing us what might have happened a few billion years ago. So this particular galaxy, because of its mass and because of its relatively large amount of stars and a lot of other stuff, very likely resulted in the warp we're observing and the distribution of a lot of other matter around the Milky Way. In the end, creating something that you see right here, with the stars that came from this galaxy orbiting around the Milky Way at an angle of approximately 25 degrees and also in a similar direction and similar orientation to what we have right here. And so this of course suggests that this particular Gaia sausage collision very likely completely reshaped the Milky Way, making it look extremely different from everything else for billions and billions of years. And even though we technically expect the galaxy to maybe reform after all of this time and potentially resemble something a little bit more spherical, the fact that it doesn't just means that the Sausage Galaxy was extremely massive. Something we've discussed in the past and something you can learn more about in one of the videos in the description. And so in this case, it just means that these two galaxies collided at an angle, which then resulted in unusual shapes inside the Milky Way, which also then resulted in the misshaped halo including very likely the gas halo and the mysterious dark matter. But because in this case we can only see the stars, at least for now, that's the only thing we can study and that's the only thing we can use to assess the overall shape. Although intriguingly enough, the fact that it's somewhat elliptical and not particularly spherical implies that when the galaxies collided, because of various interactions within the Milky Way, the stars seem to have formed two different orbits, or at least two orbits, and eventually got spread out across a much wider region. Although because these are all new discoveries, at the moment it's not really clear exactly how the stars were orbiting or what additional effects this had on our galaxy and various structures around it. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing some of the new discoveries and new revelations in regards to this unusual phenomenon coming from our own galaxy, the Milky Way, known as the Fermi Bubbles. The unusual formations discovered back in 2010 and then rediscovered in different frequencies only a couple of years ago. The formations that the scientists believe are a direct sign that back in the days, not so long ago, our galaxy was extremely active and very likely produced extremely powerful jets, maybe even turning our galaxy in what we sometimes refer to as a quasar. 
but in this case we don't really know what effects this had on anything in the galaxy and we obviously don't understand if this had any effects on planet Earth. And so this recent study kind of presents us with a few answers about some of these potential questions while also connecting several other discoveries into one single event. And so let's begin with a bit of a history to help you understand what all of this means. Back in 2008, NASA and several other agencies launched the very, very productive Fermi telescope. The telescope that was responsible for discovering a lot of different gamma ray emissions across the entire universe. Here's for example one of its many discoveries, the gamma rays coming from the famous Vela Pulsar. And for about 13 years now, it's been watching the skies and discovering new things. But back in 2010, it was able to observe an unusual formation right in the center of our galaxy. The formation that kind of resembled a typical bubble. These two formations today are referred to as Fermi bubbles because of the telescope that was responsible for discovering them. With these huge structures being several thousand light years across and being produced by extremely fast moving particles, most likely cosmic rays, which can be only detected in high energy gamma rays. But since the original discovery, it was not particularly clear what might have created this. Then, approximately 10 years after the discovery of this, the scientists discovered something else and in completely different frequencies. And in this case, instead of using a gamma ray telescope, it was a discovery made in the X-rays and a discovery made with a telescope known as Erosita, a telescope we discussed in one of the previous videos available right there or in the description below. Now, unfortunately, and this is a bit of a side note, this telescope was turned off because of the war in Ukraine and because this was actually a collaboration between German scientists and Russian scientists. We don't really know when and if this is going to become operational, but for now, this is maybe the end of its mission. Nevertheless, during its few years of operation, it was able to make some incredible discoveries in the X-rays of things that were previously invisible to us. And as you can see from this image, it sort of discovered another set of bubbles. The bubbles we now refer to as Erosita bubbles because the name of the telescope was Erosita. And we've discussed this in more detail in one of the previous videos, but the thing is, this is actually an incredible discovery for several different reasons. First of all, when it was originally found in 2020, the scientists realized it was connected to another structure that was actually already known to us, the structure that you see right there, known as the North Polar Spur. It seemed that the polar spur in this case might have actually been part of the bubble but nobody knew what it represented simply because the telescopes were not powerful enough back then. As a matter of fact, here's what all of this looked like in the X-rays prior to the data from the Erosita. That's of course the Milky Way galaxy in the X-rays. But more incredibly, as the scientists compared the data to the Fermi telescope, they discovered that these two structures were basically on top of each other, with the X-ray structure being a lot larger. Overall, all of this sort of looked like this, with the solar system visible right there on the right. Now in this case, the Fermi bubbles were approximately half as big, with the larger Erosita bubbles being approximately 25,000 light years in height. But because this was only visible in the X-rays, it also meant that it was made out of completely different stuff. Unlike the Fermi bubbles that were most likely made out of cosmic rays, which is basically highly charged particles, in most cases protons, moving extremely fast. The X-ray bubbles, or Erosita bubbles, were simply made out of extremely hot gas, most likely hydrogen gas, but in this case not charged particles, not cosmic rays. Nevertheless, because these two structures overlapped one another and were most likely coming from the center of the galaxy, it was always suggested that this was probably a result of powerful explosions from the center of the Milky Way from Sagittarius A star black hole. But there were several other explanations, including potentially a lot of supernova happening at the same time because of a sudden star formation somewhere in the region. In other words, it was not entirely clear what created these bubbles and more importantly if it was the same event or different events. And all of this because it was seen in different frequencies and contained different stuff. If it was created by different events, these events might have happened millions of years apart. And as a matter of fact, it wasn't even clear when these bubbles were formed and how long they actually stayed in this region and if they were going to disappear anytime soon. Although as a side note, the detection of these bubbles by themselves is not really unusual. These structures have been seen in other galaxies and I think the best example of this is from a galaxy known as NGC 379. 
And in this case, these superbubbles were also discovered in the X-rays, with the supermassive black hole most likely being responsible for their production. The bubbles themselves are relatively large as well, a few thousand light years across, and at least in terms of shape, do resemble the ones we find in our own galaxy, at least to some extent. But in this case, the scientists investigating this galaxy discovered that this is very likely a repeated event. It seems to happen every 10 million years or so. With the most recent bubble that you see right here being created approximately a million years ago, but in terms of size being approximately 10 times smaller than the one in the Milky Way. With the supermassive black hole in the middle of this galaxy most likely being the culprit behind this. It's approximately 2.4 million masses of the Sun in mass, or roughly around half the mass of the one that we have. And so I guess the natural next question here is, okay, well, if this is the same type of an event forming this, is this what happened in the Milky Way? Was it basically some kind of a rebubbling event that happens every few million years? Potentially massive supernova events, or something coming from the center of the black hole? So in other words, it was always kind of curious to the scientists what exactly is causing these super bubbles in different galaxies to repeat over and over. With the primary question in this case being, are these two different events millions of years apart? And that's precisely the question that the scientists behind this recent study decided to answer. They wanted to find out if this was the same event, and if it was the same event, how exactly did it progress? And in this case, the scientists decided to model this and to run a computer simulation just to see if they can recreate a similar formation using a model. With the simulation in this case being able to focus on the interaction of different types of high energy gas producing X-rays with various types of cosmic rays producing gamma rays. And according to the conclusions in this paper, it's very likely the same event. It's very likely a single event. A single powerful event that consumed anywhere from a thousand to ten thousand solar masses within a period of approximately hundred thousand years, which then released all of this huge amount of energy, creating these two massive bubbles. With all this starting approximately 2.6 million years ago, and all of this very likely resulting in extremely powerful jets, sort of similar to what we detect from a lot of other galaxies. Suggesting of course that our galaxy resembled something like this for some time. And according to their simulation, when huge amounts of matter started falling into the central black hole, the resulting pressure from the jets started to inflate the giant bubbles that then were formed around the galaxy, which pushed all of the matter that was closer to the center all across the galaxy. And in this case, this outburst also seemed to have inflated the bubbles in different phases, with the first phase most likely producing very powerful jets which quickly accelerated all of the matter away from the central black hole. And as these jets moved farther and farther away, they started to fill up the space that we now call Fermi bubbles. That's essentially why we have so many gamma rays coming from there, because the actual cosmic rays, the actual protons, charged protons, got stuck in that region. But while the Fermi bubbles were expanding across the galaxy, they also started to push a lot of the gas that was already nearby that ended up creating an enormous shockwave that's visible today. With this shockwave resulting in a lot of really heated gas, which is what's visible right here in the X-rays. And so basically the hydrogen gas that's emitting X-rays was just pushed away from the center by the huge pressure created by all of the cosmic rays coming from the black hole's center. With the study also implying that it would be impossible for any type of a supernova event, even if there were many supernova, to produce something like this. All of this very likely lasted for approximately 100,000 years, and seems to be the best explanation right now for how all of this was created. But I guess what's not clear yet is, is this kind of similar to what happened in this particular galaxy? And more importantly, is this something that happens a lot? With the most important question in this case, what effects did this have on our planet and our solar system? Because this happened 2.6 million years ago, we don't really have enough data to suggest that it affected our planet in any way. But since this was such a powerful event that's visible from planet Earth, the scientists in this case would love to find out if this does have any effect on anything. For example, maybe it could change our atmosphere. At the moment, none of this is known to us yet. Either way, definitely an exciting discovery and an exciting study, and definitely another solution to a very old mystery. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about yet another unusual discovery of some sort of a really large structure from our own galaxy, the Milky Way. 
And as you might know, there have been quite a lot of these discoveries in the last few months. Naturally, the question here is why? And the answer is, well, because of the new telescopes providing all of the data. And some of these telescopes, such as the iconic ESA's Gaia telescope, has been doing such an amazing job in the last few years that we suddenly had a huge amount of new discoveries coming in just a few months, with many of these discoveries being right next door to us. And we've talked about many of them in 2021 and you can actually find them at some point somewhere above my head. They should be popping up throughout this video and some of them are also in the description below. But this time the scientists have found another unusual structure. And potentially the largest structure we've found in the last few years. They refer to it as MAGI. MAGI filament technically. You can kind of see it right there and this is where we are located. So essentially MAGI or MAGI filament is one of the longest filaments, hydrogen filaments, discovered to date. It's also relatively far from us. It's about 55,000 light years away from us and forms a structure that's nearly 4,000 light years in length and approximately 130 light years in width. And in the past, all of the other similar filaments or clouds discovered in the Milky Way have always been approximately 800 light years in length, which is about a fifth of the size of what this is. But the thing is, because in this case we're not looking at stars, but are actually looking at gas, the scientists cannot use the data from Gaia telescope. They have to use data from somewhere else. In this case, they use the data from the survey known as THOR. Based on the Carl G. Jansky Very Large Array data that was combined into this survey that you can also find in the description below. And what this survey did was essentially look for various hydrogen clouds, various gas clouds, around our galaxy. And in order to find certain types of hydrogen, they normally do so by looking at what's known as the hydrogen line, also known as 21 centimeter line or the frequency that's produced in the atomic hydrogen when the electron here undergoes a spin change and then releases the photon of about 1.4 gigahertz or about a wavelength of 21 centimeters. This can be actually seen from everywhere and can even be detected using amateur astronomy tools. For example, it can actually be detected using a relatively powerful Wi-Fi antenna. And it has been done in the past where you can actually find really large clouds around the galaxy. But this type of hydrogen is slightly different from what we have here on Earth. This is what's referred to as the atomic hydrogen. It only contains a proton and an electron. This does not actually make planets and stars and so on. It doesn't really make anything yet. What the planets and stars are usually made out of is referred to as the molecular hydrogen. It's the molecule that's made up of two atoms of hydrogen. And that's one of the bigger mysteries in the universe. How does an atomic hydrogen turn into molecular hydrogen that's required for the production of stars? Or in other words, what causes H1 to then become H2? And it's a really important mystery to solve because, as we know today, most of the molecular clouds that then end up creating stars and condense into larger and larger chunks of matter, all of them contain this and not really as much of this. And so it just so happens that Maggie that was recently discovered is essentially the largest filament of atomic hydrogen. It's not molecular hydrogen that's usually responsible for forming planets and stars. And in case you were wondering, Maggie is just a diminutive term for Magdalena or Rio Magdalena, the name of the longest river in Colombia, the home country of one of the researchers behind the paper. And because this is the longest river, and this seems to be the longest hydrogen filament discovered so far, there is obviously some connection and thus the name. But for astronomers studying the evolution of galaxies and evolution of stars, this is a big mystery. At the moment, nobody can actually explain how such a long filament of atomic and not molecular hydrogen could be produced to begin with. And also how it got into this location where it is. It's not really in the middle of the galaxy, and instead is actually found approximately 1600 light years below the galactic plane. Which maybe could be explained by some sort of a magnetic field or possibly magnetic lines creating the actual filament and allowing it to exist in this location, but at the moment it's really not known. Mostly because it's also kind of far away to study all of this. But it's really because of the location away from the plane that the scientists were able to discover this filament. And also for one other important reason. So remember, we're talking about hydrogen gas that's everywhere. If you look at the galaxy, you're going to see it absolutely in every direction. So how exactly do you actually tell that there is a structure here that's connected that seems to form one single object? Well, here the scientists did something relatively clever that obviously has been done before. 
they looked at the overall velocity of a certain region of space and tried to see if any of the gas there was moving at a relatively similar speed. And here you can actually see a lot of the velocity changes are marked in different colors here. With everything in color blue showing us the velocity of approximately 54 km per second. And so essentially they discovered this one really really long filament that was more or less moving at the same speed, possessed relatively similar properties, similar temperature, and seemed to be moving in the same direction around the galaxy. And because of its location underneath the galactic plane, and because all of this gas also had similar velocity, it sort of stood out from the background of all of the other gas present here. And to the scientists in this paper, this only suggested that this was a coherent single structure. It was what we usually refer to as the galactic structure, with this one being really really long as well. But because the main reason for studying these is to really determine how this gas then turns into the molecular gas and starts to create stars, this is a pretty important finding. They've already discovered that approximately 8% of all of the mass here is already molecular hydrogen and has now become the gas that normally produces stars. How that happened is obviously unknown, but it's a really important structure to then try to analyze more in order to understand how all of this happens in typical galaxies. And in general, it's actually easier to understand that this is a pre-molecular cloud. Or basically, it's not this yet. It's not a cloud that's going to be developing stars, but it's sort of like the baby version of this. And the scientists realized that at several locations in this filament, it already started to sort of coalesce into slightly larger structures. Or basically at several points, it's already creating these large clouds that could potentially become this one day. And after this, they will start producing stars and new planets. Also, by mass, this is approximately 720,000 masses of the Sun. So, if this ends up producing several molecular clouds, it's going to end up producing thousands and thousands of different stars eventually. But at the moment, it's also unclear what exactly created this and how any of this works. One implication here, or I guess one suggestion, is that maybe all of this is somehow controlled by the magnetic field of the galaxy, and once the power of the atoms and basically power of gravity overcomes the magnetic field, that's when the filament collapses into various clouds and starts producing stars. But the actual process is still barely understood and a lot of scientists are really hoping to learn more about this by studying these objects or very similar objects and thus figuring out how the evolutionary process of star formation works in typical galaxies. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about some other pretty incredible discoveries from the center of our own galaxy, from the region known as Sagittarius A star, animated in this series of images taken over approximately 20 years, with this discovery from just a couple of decades ago eventually resulting in a Nobel Prize. But as you probably remember from just a few months ago, the scientists from the Event Horizon Telescope also recently revealed the image of the central black hole that we believe kind of looks like this, with this becoming one of the bigger revelations of 2022. And we've actually discussed all of the specifics of this image in the video you can find in the description. But during the campaign responsible for the production of this particular image, and during several months of observations of Sagittarius A star region, several other telescopes were also observing, trying to discover something else at the same time. And for some of these telescopes, the data actually took a little bit longer to analyze, and they've only recently started to announce exactly what was found in this region on top of the image that was created. And so very recently, some of the scientists working on the data from the ALMA Observatory, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, released the paper you can find here with something else pretty incredible discovered in the region, something that was previously unseen and took a few months to confirm based on the observations from several other telescopes. There seems to be a blob of gas orbiting around the black hole, and it was actually identified using several different frequencies. And in this case, this blob is orbiting away from the black hole at the same distance as planet Mercury from the Sun. Except that a single orbit here only takes approximately 70 minutes. Which means that whatever it is, it's orbiting around the black hole at practically 30% of the speed of light, nearly 100,000 km per second. But what exactly is it, and how exactly was it discovered? Well, first of all, some of these initial observations were actually taken for a slightly different reason. They were taken because there was an unusual flare of X-rays detected coming from the black hole itself, or at least very close to the black hole. And so back then, the scientists really wanted to figure out what this was, and what produced these unusual emissions, or more importantly, if it's actually going to happen again. 
And these kinds of flares from various black holes have been already discovered around other objects in the X-ray frequencies, but also in the infrared frequencies as well, with the explanation being very hot gas bubbles or hot spots that seem to orbit very fast and very close to various black holes. Although previously these blobs or these hot spots were only visible in the X-rays and the infrared, they have never been discovered in any other frequencies up until now. And now by using the ALMA radio telescopes, the scientists were able to confirm that they are also visible in the radio light, suggesting that these observations, these hot spots or these hot blobs, are very likely the same phenomenon, but produced when the gas that was producing X-rays or the infrared now cooled down, becoming visible at longer wavelengths. Or in other words, these blobs seem to orbit around black holes and seem to be in different temperatures. Sometimes they're very hot producing X-rays, sometimes they cool down producing just the infrared, and sometimes they cool down only producing radio waves. With all of this very likely being produced as a result of various magnetic interactions, as extremely hot gas orbiting close to the black hole interacts with the magnetic field and then ends up producing all sorts of different emissions as a result. And the reason the scientists believe it's magnetic in nature is because of the observations of what's known as polarization. Polarization or polarized light is essentially a direction of light as it comes toward us. Normally when the light detected is extremely highly polarized, it implies it came from very highly magnetic regions, such as the ones we for example detect around various pulsars, various neutron stars, or other extremely powerful objects with a lot of magnetic lines around them. And so in this case, the light detected from the black hole and the actual emissions were extremely polarized, with the polarization actually changing every 70 minutes. Or basically the polarization here was rotating at a time scale of just over an hour. With the best explanation of course being that this is something that's orbiting around the black hole and depending on the location in its orbit, being polarized differently because of the differences in the magnetic field in the vicinity of the black hole. And because all of this was also connected to the X-rays here, and because these X-rays were also polarized, it of course implied that all of this was the same event and possibly even the same kind of a blob. And at some point this blob became very hot, producing X-rays. And one of the reasons why it's actually really important to detect the polarization from the light here is because it then allows the scientists to measure the magnetic field around this black hole, revealing a lot more details about this region and also helping us understand all of the other properties of Sagittarius A star. In other words, it helps us uncover the magnetic field of the black hole and the accretion disk. At the moment, it's not entirely clear exactly what's happening here, but the initial observations have already revealed several important details. For example, there are definitive hints that this black hole is spinning and is spinning in the same direction as this particular blob. In other words, the rotation seems to be in the same way, with the accretion disk also spinning in the same direction, so all of this is moving clockwise as seen from planet Earth. And more intriguingly, it also allows us to understand the plane of motion of this object and possibly the accretion disk as well. In this case, it appears that we're looking at the accretion disk and of course this blob of matter orbiting around it, almost exactly face on, with very likely only about 20 degrees inclination. And this is based on observations from ALMA and also another project known as gravity, which implies that some of the matter around the disk is orbiting in the way that you see right here. But naturally, what produces these hot spots or how these unusual blobs of matter are formed is not currently known to us. We only know that it's magnetic in nature, but exactly why they form is unknown. And these phenomena don't even have a good name yet. But now the scientists are really hoping to see these particular objects using new observations from the Event Horizon telescopes once again. Because this is the most powerful radio telescope we have right now, it might be able to reveal something else that was missed the first time and naturally help us understand a little bit more about black holes and the environment around them. For example, not so long ago, I've discussed this new proposition from some of the scientists that suggests that if black holes are quantum in nature, they might actually have these unusual vortex-like formations on the surface, which could be responsible for some of these magnetic lines. And so if all of this then connects to these blobs, the scientists might actually find evidence for all of this and thus resolve the nature of black holes by resolving the nature of these unusual phenomena. Although as of right now, all of this is still a huge mystery. It's a very exciting discovery and it's definitely a very mysterious discovery, but the true nature of any of this is completely unknown to us. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing the center of our own galaxy once again, but not the black hole. We're going to be discussing something, or many things, that orbit around the black hole. And more specifically, if we were to move toward this area, 
which actually takes just under 30,000 light years to reach, we would sort of discover an area that resembles something like this, containing quite a lot of different stars and star-like objects, and containing quite a lot of activity and a lot of motion. Now, this is sort of the simulation here, but we do have actual images from this area as well, something that was created over a period of at least 20 years. And it's actually because of these images and because of the motion of these stars that the scientists were able to definitively say that there is something really massive and something really dense in the middle, something that's very likely a black hole, which eventually resulted in this. The scientific collaboration of the Event Horizon Telescope that created this beautiful image that we have of the central black hole. Oops, talking about the black hole again. Anyway, let's talk about the stars orbiting it. So the central region contains quite a lot of stars in orbit around the black hole, and most of them are currently known as the S stars, with the actual list being pretty long. And most of these stars are entirely different from one another, but they do basically share one thing in common. They're all gravitationally attached to the black hole itself, and they also seem to interact with one another, at least to some extent. Now, the most studied and the most well-known of these stars is the star known as S2. It's also the star that's basically allowed the scientists to study a lot of different gravitational effects and prove a lot of Einsteinian theories. As a matter of fact, uh, back in 2018, this star had its closest approach to the black hole once again and allowed the scientists to see the redshifting effects that were essentially the result of higher gravity in this region. Now, this image right here is just an illustration, it's not actually what it looked like, but the scientists did detect redshifting effects in the spectrum coming from the star as it approached the center. And when it comes to these stars, it's sort of important to understand a little bit more about the orbital dynamics when it comes to objects orbiting other objects. In this case, an object with higher eccentricity, like the object that you see in pink or I guess that's maroon color, will have much higher velocity when it approaches the star or the black hole in this case. And this region right here that we usually refer to as a periapsis. Whereas the object orbiting in a circular orbit, like the red object, will always have constant velocity around the central area. And so the scientists in this case are always on the lookout for new stars that seem to approach the black hole at their closest. Specifically here we're talking about stars that would be super super close to the center. And that's because these stars would be zooming around the black hole at ridiculously high velocities. They would actually be the fastest stars in our galaxy. And it just so happens that very recently there was an article that I seem to have seen in many different places that claimed to have discovered the new fastest star in a galaxy, based on this very recent paper that you can find in the description below, of the star known as S4716, a completely newly discovered object that's also orbiting somewhere in this region. And being such an exciting object, it already seems to have its own Wikipedia page, although a relatively short one, where it is claimed that this is the fastest star known to us, reaching the velocity of approximately 8,000 km per second as it approaches the closest part of the orbit, the one that I showed you here, known as periapsis. The thing is, that's not entirely correct. It is an exciting object, and it is an exciting star, but it's far from being the fastest. As of today, the fastest star discovered is still the one that was discovered and talked about on this channel two years ago, back in 2020. So let's maybe clarify some details and a few more things about this object, and also talk about some really exciting discoveries coming from this paper. So first, the star itself. According to the scientists, it seems to be approximately four times the mass of our Sun, representing what we usually refer to as a B-type star, with an average temperature of about 12,000 degrees. 12,000 Kelvin, that is. And what makes this star unique and quite exciting is the fact that it has the fastest orbit around the black hole. It only takes roughly around four years to orbit once. As a matter of fact, you can kind of see that in this case, its orbit is so tight compared to some of the other stars that it's actually almost impossible to even see it as its sort of is blocked by a lot of other stars in the area. The biggest culprit in this case is that S2 star. S2 in this case is so bright and moves quite fast as well that it actually ends up covering some of this area and makes detection of other stars quite difficult. Nevertheless, by using the total of five different telescopes observing this region, which is exactly what you're seeing right here, these are the actual images, the scientists were able to discover this new star and also confirm some of the other stars as well. With the star S4716 coming extremely close to the black hole, roughly around 100 astronomical units away from the center. That's almost three times as far away as Pluto, but is actually closer to us than the current position of the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. 
and at this distance it moves at a speed of about 8000 km per second. And that's of course because the black hole in the middle is really massive, with this most recent calculation suggesting that the mass is at least 4 million masses of the Sun, a little bit closer to 4.1, but not 4.3 as previously claimed. While at the same time the scientists were also even able to calculate the total mass of stuff orbiting around the black hole. And so here we're talking about both the accretion disk and a lot of other dust and a lot of other star-like and planet-like stuff that's essentially accumulated in this region. They've discovered that there's at least 20,000 masses of the Sun in the region of this black hole that seems to sort of change the orbits of certain objects that come a little bit too close. So in some sense you can think of it as the accretion disk. And in this case they were also able to determine a relatively accurate distance measurement to the black hole, establishing that it's about 26.2 thousand light years away from planet Earth. While also discovering that some of these previous observations of other stars might actually have been confused with one another because some of these stars are a little bit too bright and cover the smaller objects. With a relatively bright and really fast star known as S62, that manages to reach the velocity of about 20,000 km per second at its closest, also being really bright and moving fast enough that sometimes it's confused for other stars. Which means that the current list of S stars in this region may need to be reanalyzed by some of the future studies. Suggesting that some of these stars might not exist because they were just another star that seemed to have been in that location that some of the studies might have misinterpreted as a completely new object. But because of the shortness of the orbit of S4716, on average it does actually have the fastest velocity around the black hole. So at its closest it approaches the black hole at approximately 98 astronomical units, but at its farthest it only goes to about 702 astronomical units. And so in theory at least, it essentially has the fastest orbit around the black hole of all of the stars discovered so far, with its orbital period looking something like this. But, as I mentioned, this is not the fastest star. That record belongs to another really interesting star that approaches the black hole at a distance of just 12.6 astronomical units away from the center, almost as close as planet Saturn to the Sun, and that's a star known as S4714. We've talked about this object on the channel previously, and you can learn more about this in one of the links in the description. And in this case, at its closest, the speed of the star is approximately 24,000 km per second, roughly around 8% of the speed of light, and that makes it at least 3 times faster than the recently identified and recently discovered star, which also means that the record holder here is still the star known as S4714, and it's very unlikely that its record is going to be beat anytime soon. This older paper describes this discovery in a little bit more detail. But its orbital period is 12 years, so the only reason it has such a high velocity close to the black hole is because of the eccentricity once again. Or in other words, its orbit is a lot more oval in shape. The eccentricity here is about 98.7%, and so at its closest the speed becomes ridiculously fast. But a lot of these S stars move really fast at their closest orbit. Actually, only very few of them move with a speed of less than 1000 km per second at the closest approach, so all of them have very fast velocities. And you can actually check out this table that you can find in the description below that shows you some of the other parameters of all of these stars. In this case, if we actually sort all of these stars by speed, you can kind of see which ones are the fastest, and S2 is pretty fast compared to all of these objects. Although none of this is currently formalized and none of these names are even permanent, and so some of these properties and some of the names as well might change in the future. This is still a pretty new area of study, and in this case the scientists still don't really know much about the stars or how all of this interacts with the central black hole over time. But when it comes to S4716, one of the most surprising discoveries is actually how stable the orbit is considering the total distance to the supermassive black hole. At the moment the scientists are not entirely certain how it's able to have such a stable and somewhat permanent orbit in this vicinity. And more specifically they're really not certain how it even got here. How did the star drop its orbit so much that it approached the black hole without essentially being destroyed or without disappearing somewhere else? And so that's one of the mysteries the scientists are trying to solve. At the moment they think it's actually because of the total mass orbits in the black hole that eventually sort of interacted with the star and lowered its orbit over time, but at the moment, nobody really knows. It is, however, quite unlikely that a star like this would form in this region by itself, 
so it must have migrated here during its existence in the central region from somewhere entirely different. Nevertheless, it's a pretty exciting discovery because now by knowing its orbit and by being able to actually look at the star, the scientists can start analyzing the vicinity of the black hole even more and possibly discover some other unusual objects we didn't really know existed in this area. They can also use the minute deviations of the orbit of the star to discover any unusual gravitational anomalies that might be present in the area, either for example due to the accretion disk or possibly some other invisible objects, possibly even other black holes, orbiting around the central Sagittarius A star. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing a discovery of an extremely rare planetary nebula, a type of an object that you kind of see behind me. Although in this case, once again, the name itself doesn't really apply very well to these objects. They have nothing to do with planets and in reality represent a type of a nebula produced by stars extremely similar to our own sun, right after these stars go through their red giant period, or as they are about to turn into a white dwarf, with this probably now being one of the more popular images of this phenomena, because this was one of the images released by the James Webb. And because these nebula often form extremely beautiful formations in the night skies, they've also been extremely popular with various amateur astronomers although some of them are somewhat difficult to see because of their distances. But what's really intriguing about many of these objects is how extremely unique they are and how they're actually able to produce so many different shapes and will always have very unique features inside of them. For example, this one right here is known as the Lemon Slice Nebula, IC3568, and it kind of does resemble a lemon slice, with a lot of them also forming very unusual bipolar shapes, often extending in both directions, and this is usually because these objects are created by some kind of a binary system on the inside where a smaller star and a red giant interact throwing off a lot of the gas in two directions because of the jets from one of the objects. And in this case, as you can see from this simulation, they kind of end up forming this unusual structure that then becomes visible from extremely far away. A lot of these objects are at least a few light years across. But in this video we're going to be discussing a very recent discovery of what seems to be the oldest, potentially the biggest, and also one of the strangest planetary nebula discovered to date, found inside this open cluster known as Messier 37. A cluster that seems to contain at least 500 known stars and potentially has a total mass of about 1500 solar masses, with the overall age of all of the stars here being around half a billion years old with at least a few of the stars in this region already being in their red giant stage, or essentially being in that stage right before they turn into planetary nebula, when they essentially start bubbling up and throw off a huge amount of gas from the outer shell. And that's exactly what happened to one of these stars approximately 70,000 years ago, a star that ended up producing the object that you see right here. Now it is kind of difficult to see it, and that's because the distance here is about 4500 light years away from us. But even at this distance, this emission nebula contains the telltale signs of ionized gas ejected from an ancient red giant, something that the scientists in this case were kind of surprised to discover. First of all, because this is actually an extremely rare object because of its location. This is only the third known planetary nebula discovered inside any kind of a cluster. But in this case, because it's inside this open cluster, it actually allows this object to stay relatively undisturbed by anything else and specifically allows this nebula to expand even larger. Normally, if it was located anywhere else in outer space, the intergalactic gas would have disturbed it so much that it would probably be invisible by now. But by being inside the cluster that shelters it from a lot of interruptions, it was able to expand much farther, and more intriguingly, was able to become much older than any other planetary nebula we've ever seen. Now normally, a typical star such as our Sun is going to go through the stage relatively quickly, anywhere from about 5 to maybe 25,000 years, after which point all of the gas from the star dissipates across the galaxy and basically goes on its merry way, most likely ended up in some other object in the future. But the nebula itself becomes more or less invisible. Prior to this, some of the oldest nebula were only about 25,000 years old, and even at this point this is already pushing their limit. But this unusual object is much older, it's at least 70,000 years old according to the scientists. And they were essentially able to calculate its age by looking at the speed of the dispersion of material and then looking at the total size of this object. 
In terms of the total size, it's just over 10 light years across, one of the biggest if not the biggest ever seen. And assuming that it was expanding at constant velocity, it must have started doing so approximately 70,000 years ago, which is essentially when the original star ended its red giant stage and started to turn into a white dwarf. Which is of course the future of our own sun as well, although here we're talking about like 7 to 8 billion years in the future. You can actually learn a little bit more about this in one of the videos in the description below. But by approximating the total mass of the expanded shell and also realizing that many stars in this cluster are no older than 500 million years old, the scientists came to a conclusion that the star that essentially created this must have been approximately 2.8 solar masses, so definitely more massive than our own sun and very likely a lot more active. A star that survived for 500 million years before becoming a red giant and before it created this beautiful planetary nebula. But the other thing that makes this particular discovery kind of interesting is the location in the galaxy. Unlike a lot of other nebula and a lot of other clusters, this is actually sort of on the outskirts of the Milky Way. Or essentially it's in the opposite direction from the center of our own galaxy. If you were to look at it from planet Earth, you would first of all have to turn around completely in order to discover this cluster and the nebula. This is a location we often refer to as the galactic anti-center. And moreover, it seems to be located right at the tip of one of the nearby galactic arms. And because of its location, it's one of the brightest and one of the easier visible clusters seen from planet Earth. Meaning that studying this particular nebula, or discovering more unusual features inside this cluster, is going to be so much easier for a lot of future studies and a lot of future observations. Although at the moment, we only have this image right here, not really that good yet, to be able to produce any detailed observations or any detailed analysis. But because these nebula play a very important role in the chemical evolution of the galaxy, and they actually tend to produce a lot of important elements inside of them as well, the discovery of this really old planetary nebula is going to be exceptionally important for the scientists studying the evolution of galaxies. And because even after 70,000 years, it's still visible in a lot of different frequencies of light, it's quite likely that it's going to serve as a very important investigation target for a lot of astronomers in the future. But this is also an extremely rare object. Not only is it so big and so old, it's also one of the few spherical nebula without any major protrusions or binary features. The vast majority of nebulae discovered will often have something sticking out somewhere. This one doesn't. And so finding these spherically symmetrical objects, especially once not so far away from us, is already quite a big achievement. Especially because it's only recently that the scientists started to figure out how some of these unusual features are formed in these nebula. For example, in this case, a slight warp inside the disk of the star might produce certain features that eventually produce something like this. And so eventually, through various computer simulations, it's quite possible that the scientists are going to be able to work out what this particular star system looked like in the past by basically tracing back the shape of the star system through the shapes and the deformations seen in the planetary nebula. It's not something we can do just yet, but it's something that a lot of scientists are definitely interested in discovering. In the last few years, the scientists have made some really incredible discoveries about our own galaxy, the Milky Way. Discoveries that really redefined our understanding of what our galaxy looks like. And so even though we kind of assume that the galaxy might resemble something like this, the reality is a lot more complicated. First of all, it seems to be kind of warped. It also has all of these unusual streams around it. It has a very large halo that's also slanted as well and possesses a lot of other features such as globular clusters present all over the place. With all of this discussed in some of the previous videos you can find in the description. But more unusual features become apparent if you start observing the galaxy in other frequencies, for example radio frequencies, infrared light, or even x-ray and gamma ray light that obviously our eyes cannot see, which obviously transforms the galaxy even more. So here's the visible light, here are some of the older observations in the x-rays, the gamma rays, the infrared light, microwave light, and of course radio light as well. But these observations are on a slightly older side. A lot of newer observations started to discover some really incredible features that even today we have trouble explaining. And today we're going to be discussing one of these features, unusual stream-like formations or unusual filaments that seem to be present in the Milky Way itself but also seem to be present outside of the galaxy and obviously in other galaxies as seen by various other telescopes. 
And here we're talking about these very strange filaments we discussed in one of the previous videos, once again in the description below, that kind of become apparent if you look at the galaxy by observing it in radio frequencies. Filaments that stretch for at least several light years and that seem to propagate throughout the galaxy and seem to be located in a lot of different regions. Although predominantly they seem to be associated with a lot of ancient supernova or regions with a lot of molecular gas that might possess quite a lot of magnetic energy which the scientists believe creates these unusual phenomena. And so in some sense these are believed to be magnetic filaments, potentially related to a much smaller phenomenon of solar filaments we observe on the surface of the Sun that is magnetic in nature, but also obviously may be formed in some entirely different way we still don't understand. And intriguingly, the scientists behind this recent paper have actually originally discovered the first filament back in the 1980s, pretty much four decades ago. Only a small one was seen at first, but more and more started to be discovered as our telescopes became better. And today, over a thousand filaments have already been discovered all across the Milky Way galaxy, with some of them stretching all the way up to 150 light years in length, with some of the longest ones being located very close to the center of the galaxy. But the recent paper focused on something slightly different, discovering similar filaments in other galaxies, such as this distant radio galaxy that has somewhat similar filaments formed by the massive black hole in the middle, with several other similar filaments discovered in some other galaxies, but intriguingly all of them being dramatically longer than anything in the Milky Way. For example, this one right here is over 300 light years in length several times longer than a typical filament in the Milky Way galaxy. And although many of them do seem to resemble the ones we've discovered in the Milky Way as well, such as the one on the right, in terms of the sheer size, they're just dramatically larger. As you can see, the one on the left is approximately 3000 times longer, even though it possesses a relatively similar shape. Here is another comparable image between the Milky Way on the bottom, an object referred to as Feather, and another object 25,000 times larger located in a distant galaxy, but with somewhat similar features. But in most cases, a lot of these observations came from very active, very massive radio galaxies with really powerful black holes in the center. Although because of the similarity in structure, it might actually appear as if it was created by a relatively similar type of phenomenon. And so the underlying physical mechanism could be generally the same. But unlike the filaments in the Milky Way galaxy, are only visible because, first of all, they're much larger, but they also seem to be much, much older, very likely existing for millions or even billions of years. Although a lot of newly discovered filaments mostly seem to be part of a large galactic cluster that contains thousands of different galaxies interacting with one another approximately 1 billion light years away from planet Earth. But it's the radio galaxies within the cluster that seem to be forming a lot of these filaments. Although despite being very likely more powerful and much larger, their overall magnetic field is much weaker as well, at least 1000 times weaker than what we actually observe here in the Milky Way. And also, unlike the variety of filaments in the Milky Way galaxy, the majority of extragalactic filaments seem to be mostly at 90 degree angle from the black hole jets that usually look something like this. Which means that they create a kind of an unusual shape that's I think better visible right here. And this particular feature is obviously kind of difficult to explain right now. But because the overall shape is very similar to what we see in the Milky Way, and because even the length to width ratio is exactly the same, the overall mechanism responsible for their production is believed to be the same as well. Or at least extremely similar. For example, as seen in this filament, it seems to possess more energy closer to its origin, and in this case it's closer to the jet from the black hole, but starts to lose energy as it travels farther down eventually disappearing into nothingness. And in both cases, it's not entirely clear where all of this originates. For example, for the radio galaxy, it's assumed that the jet provides the initial energy, with the filament then moving on its own path and losing the energy in the process. But what exactly makes these filaments so long and allows them to accelerate for such a long distance is still not entirely clear. I mean, for example, here you're looking at something that's over 150,000 light years in length. That's basically the size of our own galaxy. More intriguingly, this seems to be formed by electrons traveling along the magnetic lines. And because they don't travel at the speed of light, it means that for some of these objects, these electrons travel for 100 or even 500,000 years before they finally disappear. In some cases, this can be up to a million years. And what exactly allows them to travel for so long without breaking apart is of course unknown. 
Now one potential explanation here is, well, maybe all of this comes from the motion of the galaxy itself. As the galaxy rotates, it might create a comet-like tail behind it, essentially forming these annual filaments. The interaction between the motion of the galactic edge and the stuff between galaxies maybe creates some of these filaments in the process. Or the other explanation could be related to some kind of a turbulence inside a relatively weak magnetic field. As various galaxies inside the cluster move around, the resulting interaction can start creating various vortices and a lot of motion on the inside. And as the weak magnetic field starts to wrap around these disturbances, it can get stretched, folded and amplified, with time resulting in the variety of different filament-like structures with relatively strong magnetic field inside of them. At least that's one of the two explanations the scientists propose right now, although the reality is that we still actually have no idea how many of these are formed. And more realistically, we actually have no idea if the ones inside the Milky Way, despite their similarity, have anything in common with the ones outside of the Milky Way, or if these are actually completely different phenomena despite their similarity in shape. Now it's most likely that these are magnetic in nature, and very likely are the result of something extremely powerful such as a supernova producing these over time, but there's also a chance that many of these are created by different events that actually result in similar observations. And so in other words, even after years and years of research, we found so many, over a thousand now, yet the actual origin is still a little bit mysterious. One of the major discoveries from our own galaxy, the Milky Way, in the last few years was actually the discovery of the unusual formations above and below the galaxy we normally refer to as the Fermi Bubbles, named after the telescope, the Gamma Ray Telescope, that originally discovered them roughly around 12 years ago. And these particular formations at first did not really have much reason to be there until we realized they were most likely formed by a major expulsion from the center of the galaxy, from the supermassive black hole Sagittarius A star. But even after years and years of investigation, there are still new mysteries being discovered about these bubbles, with some of them discussed in one of the videos you can find in the description below. But today we're going to be discussing another discovery, a discovery that might actually solve one of the mysteries about these formations, or actually a mystery within the mystery. If you were to look at the structure in more detail, you would actually start discovering some other features within it that are difficult to explain. There's one right here known as the cocoon. And the reason this cocoon is so mysterious is really because it seems to be much brighter than a lot of other spots. This particular region seems to produce more radiation, more powerful radiation, and seems to contain a lot of accelerated cosmic rays coming from this southern lobe. And all of this was actually discovered approximately 11 years ago in 2011. You can find the PDF that describes some of these discoveries in the description below. And so this cocoon was always also kind of mysterious. Why is it that this particular region seems to have more of everything in it? If this was a bipolar emission from our black hole, shouldn't it be more or less equally distributed? If there was more emissions and more radiation and more mass on one side, what's the actual reason for it? Now naturally this is just one of many mysteries about the Fermi bubbles and one of many such structures, but it looks like this particular mystery has now been solved and specifically solved by the Australian scientists whose paper you can find in the description below, with the results from this paper providing very definitive solutions, but also providing an extremely logical explanation. So first of all, when studying the cocoon or studying this particular region, the scientists realized that there's actually something else very close to it that was also discovered only a few years ago. It's slightly easier to see it in this image, but one of the major satellites of the Milky Way galaxy, known as Sagittarius Dwarf Spheroidal Galaxy, has its core right here. Okay, it's actually not really that easily visible, but we know that this right here, M54 or Massey 54 Globular Cluster, also very likely represents its core. But the rest of the galaxy is not particularly easily visible, and there's a really important reason for that. Over the period of several billion years, as it orbited around the Milky Way, it was actually tidally disrupted, spaghettified, turned into an extremely long string, and more or less absorbed otherwise. These are known as the stellar streams and the scientists have already discovered quite a few of them. And all of them are a result of ancient collisions or ancient absorptions of various galaxies that orbited the Milky Way. That's how our galaxy grew so big. And the main core of this galaxy, along with its center, M54, is actually right here, in this region. 
which just so happens to be very coincident with the location of the cocoon from the Fermi bubbles. Ok, but this could be just a coincidence. However, there's at least one more piece of evidence. As this image from the study illustrates, both the cocoon and the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy core also seem to have very similar shape, but more importantly, very similar orientation. And that by itself is already very difficult to reproduce by accident. So we have orientation, we have the shape, and we have the location. Unfortunately, the distance here is very difficult to determine, mostly because that's how things are in space. We can't really measure the redshift here, and we don't really have any other objects to compare this to, so distance-wise we don't really know where this is. But three pieces of evidence is enough to kind of assume that maybe, just maybe, this is exactly what produces the cocoon. And so the higher concentration of gamma rays that seem to be coming from the Fermi bubbles, in reality, seem to be actually coming from the core of Sagittarius Dwarf. But because of our position in the galaxy, it appears as if it's coming from the Fermi bubbles, even though it's really behind them. And in order to make their point even more scientific, the scientists decided to create several emission models with various explanations in those models, including the model where the cocoon was part of the Fermi bubbles, with only one of these simulations, only one of the models, reproducing what we're observing. If the emissions were coming from the Sagittarius Dwarf, as shown in this image right here, we would get exactly the same gamma ray observations as we're actually seeing in real life, with all of the other models just not really being as convincing. And naturally, because these are some of the brightest and the most powerful gamma rays produced in our galaxy, this has always kind of bugged the scientists. They wanted to know what exactly is producing this. Looks like now they kind of know. The brightest and the highest energy gamma ray radiation is not actually coming from the Milky Way disk. It's coming from the leftover Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. But that's just part of the answer. Still, what exactly is actually producing it though? What's causing these gamma rays even if it's coming from a Sagittarius Dwarf? Well, normally, in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, most of the gamma rays are produced by the collision between cosmic rays and various types of interstellar gas. It sort of kind of looks like this. You have the photon and the electron, and as one strikes the other, gamma rays are produced. And all of this is then seen in various gamma ray emissions coming from the Fermi bubbles. And these cosmic rays generally come from very distant objects, usually very powerful supermassive black holes in distant galaxies. But that gas came from the supermassive black hole in the middle of our own galaxy. For Sagittarius Dwarf though, this explanation doesn't really work. Mostly because we know that this is a much, much smaller satellite galaxy, and we know that for the most part it seems to have been already stripped of all of its gas, very likely 2 to 3 billion years ago. And most of this gas is still kind of visible as the long string that stretches around the Milky Way. And so since there is probably no interstellar gas here to be interacting with the cosmic rays, this cannot really be the explanation. And the other explanation for very powerful emissions could be a lot of supernova, like huge amounts of supernova. But at the moment it's kind of difficult to explain why there will be so many supernova in this region and no other signs of these have been detected so far. And that kind of leaves us with maybe just one possible explanation. And that's actually a very similar explanation to how scientists try to explain the excess gamma rays in the middle of the Milky Way. This region might actually contain quite a lot of very powerful pulsars. Or essentially very powerful neutron stars, and specifically millisecond pulsars, that are spinning extremely fast, and as they spin they emit a lot of radiation, and some of this radiation includes a lot of powerful gamma rays. But pulsars generally do not live very long, so there has to be a reason why they were suddenly created. And in this case, there is actually an explanation for that as well. Their existence can be explained by the most recent formation period in this particular galaxy as it interacted with the Milky Way. And today it's actually believed that as Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy orbited around the Milky Way and as it passed through its disk, both galaxies experienced very dramatic star formation periods, which happened at least twice. And we actually discussed some of these discoveries in one of the older videos you can find in the description. And so if there are actual signs of star formation in the Milky Way, we expect these signs to be in the other galaxy as well. But naturally there is still something that we cannot explain. Why exactly is it so bright? Why is it so powerful? These emissions seem to be much brighter than the ones in the Milky Way galaxy, and even brighter than the ones in the nearby Andromeda galaxy. Although the scientists do provide at least one possible explanation. If these pulsars are relatively old, maybe 7 billion years old, and if they also have relatively low metal content, there is maybe a chance that they would be producing so many gamma rays. But this also means that we should be seeing very similar observations in other dwarf galaxies, 
For example, in the nearby large and small Magellanic clouds. At the moment, it doesn't really seem that way. So either something is really unusual about this particular galaxy, or the other explanation could maybe involve the mysterious dark matter. Some of the dark matter scientists have long proposed that dark matter particles should also be producing excess gamma ray observations. And so there's actually a chance that these gamma ray emissions could maybe be produced by the dark matter inside Sagittarius Dwarf, which already implies that the discoveries from the study are going to be discussed and analyzed for many years to come. It's either going to help us understand how galaxies evolve, or it's going to help us understand what exactly dark matter is and how exactly it acts in various galaxies, or possibly provide a lot more answers than we can even imagine. Either way, super important discovery, very important paper, and definitely an intriguing explanation to an old mystery. Which also means that we're going to be coming back and talking more about these galactic interactions and galactic collisions, and how they influence our galaxy and what effects they produce on the galaxy in some of the future videos as well. But you should also probably check out some of the previous videos that should be in the description. On that note, thank you for watching, subscribe, maybe share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.